What's up, guys? This is Ice. How are you doing today? Looks like uh, we've got a fair amount of folks in chat here. Welcome office hours for June. <laughs> we barely made it. Can we hear more burb stuff? I don't know. More burb stuff? Perhaps? <laughs> Anyways, guys. Uh, yeah, office hours today. Early and everything. Because uh, this is like the only time I can in the last of the month, right? And uh, I know DRL Valley Simulator is dropping sometime soon too, but uh, uh, I think we're going to have to wait to stream that till maybe Sunday, unfortunately. Uh, back at the shop tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, goodness, it's been a busy week. But glad we could get to off stars. We got a slew of questions from the post. Uh, and then, of course, I'm also going to be joined by Jersey and Armagon in chat. Uh, Mickley is out, so uh, everyone give good thoughts to Mickley. He's out for a, uh, a funeral and that sort of thing, so we're not going to have him, uh, unfortunately. But uh, anyways, thoughts to Mick, and uh, we're going to have Jersey, God help us, and Armagon help with the live questions. Um, and it looks like we've got... Good God, you guys, already? Like, really? Blackbird? Really? Really? I know who you are now. I actually know who you are now. <laughs> Uh, thank you. 20 gifted memberships from Blackbird before the stream even started with another five on top, because why not? <laughs> Himbo Jimbo, Breakman for four months. You've been a Breakman for four months for free. You've got good luck. Shrub, can we hear more burb stuff? I'm not sure what you mean by hear more burb stuff. <laughs> Brett, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladed swallow? Uh, it depends on if it's an African or European swallow. Good, sir. King must know these things. James Patterson, fireman for 13 months. Oh goodness, we've had more than a year now. Late shift at work today, so you're gonna be need a substitute penguin for this one. Oh boy. Well, I guess uh, I guess so, somebody. Well, we'll try and fill your shoes, but they're rather large, sir. Octopet 5313. Hey, how did three quarters go? Uh, I might have to show uh, a spoiler of one of the episodes of the three quarters show. Uh, at later on in the stream because oh my god I was reviewing some of the footage and it's just uh, it's just great it's just priceless the uh <laughs> we had a couple technical issues that'll be frustrating but uh <laughs> there's there's some good humor in there so anyway <clears throat> per Michael Janberg what's up Pice you love your train videos I'm glad you do and then RC one year of memberships gold lamp there you are can't stay for long helping the family move godspeed <laughs> and 491's owned another whiskey yeah we can we can get her taken care of and friends of frankfurt and cincinnati you just got your first car a 2006 cadillac cts a man after leighton moreland's heart yeah <laughs> all right well i'm gonna jump into uh chat so that we can get armagon and jersey introduced here and go to voice activities so that um they can actually hear me and I don't have to press buttons. Anyways, say hello, gents. Hello there. There they are. So anyways, we're gonna get into the questions here. I'm gonna start and uh, you know, you you two, if you see any good ones come in through chat, um, we shall, uh, you know, grab them and then we can pop in and out between those, so. <clears throat> highball 5550 asked what does storage on a steam locomotive look like are there built-in cabinets somewhere where crew members can store various items what is the validity of ends of water legs being converted into storage i think this is going to be really specific to the type of locomotive and the railroad um all of our rio grande stuff has the water leg which is the the, the top of the tender tank um or the the narrow part where the coal is in between or the fuel is in between um the tops of those are where all the storage is around the tank valves uh, or under the seats. But that's about it. Um, there's not any other real dedicated storage spots except for maybe the doghouse. Um, <laughs> we need not talk about the collection of cursed items that are in 491's doghouse. Oh, but now I've spoiled it, so now I'm going to be asked. Anyway, maybe someday. Uh, <laughs> so definitely water legs. Um, I've seen other engines that had like toolboxes and dedicated cabinets, particularly early. You saw the kind of flip up toolboxes on the top of the water legs or on the back of the tender. Um, 491's also got a toolbox on the front by the smoke box and a lot of engines had stuff like that too. So it just kind of depends. Good question. 
300 pound basement asked, what is Jeff's feet doing on the Johnson bar while pulling the brake application with the four views of the brake pipe pressure from the recent long train short thing, uh, short railroad clip. Yeah, Jeff is actually operating the Johnson bar with his foot. Everyone thinks it's kind of funny when they watch clips of us running 491. They're like, oh my God, they've played the, the Johnson bar with their foot. And it's because you physically can't really get it in the corner with your hand. So if you got to move the bar, it's like, it's so far forward and in, in a narrow space between the boiler and the cab wall, you're either getting out of the seat trying to push it forward, or you can just use your foot. And so almost all of us use our feet to move the Johnson bar around on the 491 unless we're going into reverse. So uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty straightforward there. And, and he also asks, saw the, the Garrett Rio Grande thing. Your question, why? Love the work that went into it. Talk to you soon. Oh, thank you, William. Um, <clears throat> that, there are a lot of questions about the damn Rio Grande Garrett. So the Rio Grande Garrett is not Layton's. It's a friend of Layton and I's. I'll re leave him nameless unless he wants to be named. But uh, he's storing the locomotive at uh, Layton's house. And so Layton was playing with it and just had to show us how cursed it was. But it's an actual production run brass model by, I believe, Westside? Because they made too many K27s and they couldn't sell them all. And so they said well, what can we do with all these engines that we've made? And then they built that cursed thing. <laughs> and so I think there's a hundred of them that were made. So yeah, that's a, that's a whole thing. <laughs> all right, I'm seeing some green things in here. Oh boy. Joshua DePay, you found the gold. Love you guys, thank you. Thank you. 12 months of being a brakeman, much appreciated. Jersey Central 833. What's your favorite locomotive? <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that question. That question <laughs> is honest to God in the asked questions on the posts. It literally is there. Somebody literally asked, like, explain in detail your favorite locomotive. And I'm like, You're kidding my me. God, man. <laughs> St. Ortman, Brakeman, for three months, did they ever use coke fuel instead of coal? I don't know. Probably. That sounds like something that would probably happen at some point, but uh, I don't know. Armagon, any clue? Any railroads ever use coke? Not sponsored. Armagon's not here. Well, I can tell you some engineers definitely use coke. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just showing my, my coke zero because... Uh, Heist runs on Coke Zero. That is a, a legitimate truth. But Gamer I thought Joe. you weren't a real engineer. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. I don't know what that thing is back there. I don't know what it's for. Anyway, <laughs> Gamer Joe says he's at the East Broadtop today and tomorrow. We'll have fun. Enjoy. Foam. Look at the things. It's a cool railroad. Thank you for the top chat. All right. Let's see. Continuing on. Rob Kiger 3434 asks i'm not sure if you discussed it in earlier episodes but would you or the other guys know um <clears throat> how they get the water from the ox tender to the main tender oh, i'm not actually 100 percent certain is it suction gravity or both also not maybe silly but is the ox tender only for water or can it be used for fuel love the 101s learn so much more than you realized from the videos well i'm glad you do um i would i'm not 100 percent certain how up or other railroads do it um. i mean you could theoretically, if you just hosed connectioned it in, the gravity would like treat the whole thing as one big, big tank and it would equally draw from them all. But I don't know if that's the way they do it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like UP has pumps involved at this point these days for their setup, but I, I don't honestly know. I believe they're all gravity. And as for the alternate usage uh, for things like the Union Pacific gas and coal turbines uh, one of the tenders was used not for water but for the low quality like bunker C oil and in the case of the coal turbine I believe the coal that might have actually been water in that one interesting but yeah <clears throat> and in terms of the conversion thing you probably could convert a water ox to use oil or store oil but you wouldn't want to be regularly doing that because you don't want to end up with water in your oil or oil in your water. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me, I've got an oil in the water story that we can talk about later. Um, 
uh, you don't want to do either of those things. So, it, 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 like, you'd have to totally completely clean the tank, and then you would need the different um, sorts of appurtenances that come with an oil tank uh, as opposed to just a water tank. So I doubt they would do that, really. You'd rather have purpose-built things that are designed for those use cases. Um, and I know UPs, at least, these days, behind, like, Big Boy, as we saw from yesterday, um, is just uh, <clears throat> uh, just water, so... Drew Barker, 8504, a double-edged two-parter. Have I ever visited the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento? I have not, but I want to. And if slash when you have the means, what other little narrow gauge engines would you consider building? <laughs> Insert air compressor means here. Ah, I mean, we can, we can dream all day about locomotives that we would build. And in my head, the logical progression uh, goes from small to big. So you start with the Zoomy boy. Then you do a Uinta passenger tank. Um, and then you do, like, then you'd probably do, like, a C25, because that would be kind of cool, and it doesn't exist anymore. And then you just, like, if you get that far and you've made that many, like, then you just get stupid and you either do a Uinta articulated or you just go for the L75. So, that's, uh, I have a that's, suggestion. The, lo that's the logical progression. <laughs> I have a suggestion of what not to build. The, the fairly. Never. Oh, no. Well, okay, the Fairly, I'm willing to forgive. Okay. What I cannot what, forgive. What's more heinous than the Fairly? Uh, the Freak over at the North Pacific Coast. The, oh, no. The, the Cab Ford. Oh, the 20. Oh, yeah, no, that's. That, yeah, no, no. No. That didn't no, work thanks. the first time. <laughs> but uh, I noticed in your in your list of, of new builds, you are you are lacking one in particular. To what? The East Broad Top 11? Do I look like I'm from the East Coast, bud? I know, but I, you're looking like someone that would have the resources to do it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> that I have another be, alternative. It would probably be a smart choo-choo to do in an in-between step. What about a South Park Mason bogey? Oh, a bogey! Ooh. Bogey would actually be really good. Bogey would in be really good. In original condition paint. Bogey, bogey would be an interesting challenge, though, because the FRA would not find it copacetic as designed uh so you would have to do some either get some waivers figured out or you would have to um kind of cheat the design somehow because the bogey uses the boiler as the frame and and very true the well, alphabet does not like that <laughs> i mean they, they they made it work with the um the one that still runs um that thing is fra certified did they build a subframe or did they just find a waiver or something or what? I have no clue what they did. I just know it runs and I, I, I if I were to guess they did something during the regaging of the engine. Um but whatever it is, it still articulates and everything. Um I don't know what they did, but I mean it, it works. <laughs> well I'm sure it does, but yeah, it, it, it is a problem that would need solved, is the point. But uh, yeah. definitely cool. Uh, regardless, that'd be super fun to do. So, okay. Let's see. Let me hit these top chats while we're here. DRRP, fireman for six months. Six months. Keep up the great content, heist. We'll do. Thank you. Fine ape thirteen ninety three. Brigman for one month. Using your free chat before you forget. Forty fourteen for the win. Forty fourteen for the win indeed. <laughs> but Brett just goes Mason. Yes. Yeah, no, that's that's the real answer. Aviation 365. Hello, Heist. Followed your YouTube for a bit with limited interest in trains. A few days ago you had your train story of a lifetime when Amtrak 14 that derailed from a truck out from under California, thankfully uninjured. Oh goodness, you were on that train? Oh good heavens. Well, I'm glad you're uninjured. Yeah, that was a nasty one. So yeah, that uh that's never good. When that, when the, uh, <clears throat> when the train versus truck is bad enough that the train derails is never a good time. And no, we're not putting a fucking ridgeway on the goddamn bogey. <laughs> there is no ridgeway going on this Mason bogey. But the game says there is. It must be right. No. Anyways, <laughs> Forge Gamer, Brakeman, four months of free memberships. Yeah, lucky man. Blackbird, your picks, the bogey, the mountain, the L75, L101, and the East Broad Top 2102. Uh, the L75 and the L101 are the same thing. 
but uh yeah <laughs> that's a good list but that's that's the really hard list like that's the dream big list but uh definitely uh definitely on there so <laughs> no no Ridge, stop talking about ridgeways on the bogey Daylight PNW Productions, Fireman for five months. Have ever been to Train Mountain, world largest seven and a half inch gauge road? No, I haven't. I got invited uh, last year, and the timing just did not work out, which was a bummer. So I've got a friend that's got a K27 and a C16. That would have been fun. <laughs> Jack Morgan, the fuel tender of the IRM's gas turbine, was used as 4449's auxiliary tender for a few years, then reunited with the GTEL. Also, thoughts on Swiss NG. That's cool. And Swiss NG is super cool. The Swiss did a bunch of crazy train things that are all really neat. So, all right, back to the questions. Unless, uh, did you guys get any good live questions that were not top chats? Um, has, uh, okay, well, has anyone ever tried to capture, condense, and reuse the exhaust steam from a locomotive? Yeah, they tried that a couple times. And I want to say South Africa tried it the most recently, I want to say. Um, and the size of condenser that you need, and then the like, the loss in draft has just made it not efficient or right enough. So, uh, another one is someone is saying that you've mentioned before that the K37s should really be 284s due to the actual weight on the trailing truck. What would it have taken to make those changes back when in service? I uh, I mean I don't think the geometry is right to actually yeah. fit a two axles in there because of the way the ash pan is set up. Like there's, you would have to totally redesign the pan, like the rear end, the rear end of the engine would need a redesign. Like the, the frame is wrong to fit a uh, second axle back there. Uh, the, the ash pan's totally wrong. And the ash pan's totally wrong anyways. Um, so like it, it really would have needed more than feasible to do it. But I mean, it, it, it would have been a lot better for the weight distribution if they did do that. But uh, it's one of those things that they didn't do it for a reason because it would have been a pain in the butt to do it. So, <clears throat> um, and what happens when you open the throttle while the bar is dead center? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Uh, it depends on where the valves are sitting. Depends on if you're uphill, downhill. Like if you're on enough of a hill and the valves are in the right spot, um, and you have Stevenson valve gear you would actually start moving if you didn't have enough like weight behind you to hold you or whatever. Um, if you have wall shirts, you'd probably just sit that you'd probably, would you sit there? Or would you roll? You might roll until it admits steam into the, the pistons. And then it might, if, if you're on a, if you're on level track, nothing with wall shirts. If you're uphill with wall shirts and you open it on center, you would probably roll backwards until it admits steam into one of the sides and then then it might try and help you run but you might just roll because it really doesn't uncover the ports for long enough uh with wall shirts when it's really in center um if it was perfectly set and like perfectly brand new wall shirts it might but uh we don't need to talk about how worn out 491 is <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah stevenson will actually run and continue running even one notch in the opposite direction than you're running and I've tested this with 20 um, during Polar Express. I had the throttle all the way open, wide open, all the way to the brake stand. You don't put the throttle on the ceiling with 20. You bring it all the way to the feed valve. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it literally hits the feed valve, and that, that's as far as you go. But I had the throttle wide open, and I had the bar hooked one notch in reverse. Not one notch past center, because center on 20 is actually like three notches back because of the RGS and the reach rod. And so one click even further back and she just keeps putting along, putting power down. So that was uh, Jeff Frost from Strasburg who did um, did a lot of work on the valves. It was like, hey, I never got to try this. You should try it. And I was like, oh, oh, this is cool. I didn't know it would do that. Um, so super neat. Um, but yeah, if you're, I mean, like, yeah, it depends. Stevenson will do something. Wall shirts probably won't. Uh, Baker would probably be with wall shirts. And that's just the, with the, the way that the lap and lead is set up uh, with those valve gears. So, um, and then someone else, I don't know. Do you have the? Are you allowed to say the stable cap story on 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 live? Yeah, I've, I've because that story someone before. someone is asking, have you ever had anything on the locomotive in the museum explode? 
I mean, and yeah, I that, mean, would be, that would be the closest. That's the closest. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't necessarily a true explosion, but... Oh, and I pointed back, but at the stable cap is actually on my desk right here from the last time I showed it. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, we could do that. And this is another one that I should probably just make its own video. That time I almost died. Uh, long story short is we were taking these off for the first time in 50 years. These are the flexible stable caps. Uh, they actually seal around the flexible stable. Uh, there's a little nipple that comes out of the boiler um, and this threads onto it. It's about two and a half inches across, maybe two inches across, something like that. Um, two and some change, I don't remember. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I was trying to get these off and they hadn't come off since the 60s. And so they were being very persnickety, unsurprisingly. So I was using a torch to heat them until they glowed just a dull red and spin them off nice and easy. Um, and this was the bottom one uh, on the outside row. And apparently uh, the boiler didn't get drained all the way. Um, and, and this is a safety culture thing. Like uh, management just said, like, get it done, get it done, get it done. Don't worry about it. Like, go go do the thing. Don't worry about it. Like, it's drained. Go. And the they dumped everything out the blowdown. Which drains the boiler 99% of the way, but you got to pull the uh, <clears throat> the corner plugs out too on the K37 to drain it totally. And this was in the water space. Enough water had seeped past the bolt uh, to the head where this ceiling surface is that when I started to heat this and everything expanded a little bit, I guess the bolt sealed in the sheets um, and then the, the water flashed to steam and then this exploded. Like, I mean, it sounded like somebody had a gun in front of my face fired their shotgun and then this became disappeared um <laughs> weighs probably i don't know 10 ounces or something i mean it's thick iron or steel or whatever it is probably steel um and i mean it just disappeared and we found it across the shop it was um we were in stall one we found it in stall five it rocketed off hit the wheel right where that big divot is hit the wheel on the, the locomotive and put this huge dent in it and then it went all the way across the shop. Um, and had it been one row inboard, it would have hit the wheel and gone in through my face because I was in between the frame with an axle right behind me with the, the torch heating these things like right in front of my face. Um, and so I was deaf for a little bit there. Like a good, uh, good 30 seconds, couldn't hear anything. Uh, so yeah, I can't recommend that. But yeah, anything explode, this. This is the closest thing. Uh, that we've had as an explosion and it was while the engine was cold so strange anyway <clears throat> let's see let me catch up on these top chat thingies here gregory I've got tame a question uh after the top chat okay gregory tame brakeman for five months thoughts on norwegian couplers asking for a friend they're interesting I don't know how efficient they are, but they're interesting. He's talking about those hammer things. Patrick G, 1902, Brakeman for two, two months. Mark, your faces make great backgrounds sometimes. I'm glad. <laughs> part, part of my job on the internet is to make dumb faces. And thankfully I make them anyways. And so I just have to film myself and, uh, and, then, and then it's an easy job. So anyway, the gamer plays Brakeman for a month. Heist you a Chad, keep it up. I thought chads were bad. I'm too much of a boomer for this. <laughs> okay, what you got, Argon? Oh, no. Okay, so Sensa Sean asks, thoughts on a narrow gauge 2680, cursed shit or cool? I'm in very interested to hear your answer to this. I mean, it would be cool, but it would also be cursed. <laughs> I mean, it can be both. <laughs> Ain't nobody saying that it can't be both. Uh, yeah. Uh I, I, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know why you do that in the first place, but, yeah. I mean, they never existed on the narrow gauge, but uh, the Great Northern I know, had the GM a class. Had them. Yeah. Yeah, yep. and they really liked them so much so that they rebuilt them, like, two separate times. Wacky. Wacky. Wacky, but neat. All right. Getting back to the questions from the post, Shadow Tiger 2564. Why do steam whistles have multiple chimes? Uh, b because railroads wanted them to. I don't know if there's an actual <clears throat> explicit reason why they had multiple chimes other than to, to make a bit of harmony, which sounds a little bit more unnatural 
uh, than one tone to make it more obvious that it's a warning, but that's eh. How do they interact to make the sounds? Each chime does its own thing. And sometimes if there's things set up kind of goofily, like they, they do cross play a little bit, but primarily the actual tones they're creating, it's like you treat each one like it's an individual whistle, basically. You're most familiar with the Japanese National Railway seven chime. It seems that like half blast, they play one sound and at full, they make a different sound like the different notes are playing. Yeah, so that's, uh, <laughs> I've got a video for you. It's called Whistles 101. I put it out last August that kind of goes into all this science in long detail. Uh, but the basic thing is that the length of the chamber establishes the, the base pitch. And then as the steam temperature increases, it increases the speed of sound in the steam cloud. Um, and then that makes those vibrations occur more quickly, which it changes the pitch. But the phenomena doesn't scale linearly with chime length. So if you just change the pitch of a recording of a five chime, you don't actually get like what the whistle actually does because the shortest chime is going to change a lot of pitch over time and the longest chime is barely going to change at all. So uh, because you have so much more volume to deal with and the wavelength is actually physically longer, when you try to modulate that, you end up modulating it less respectively. So anyway, you should go watch uh, Whistles 101 for a little bit more than that. Um <clears throat> Let's see, the next question, for, still from Shadow Tiger 2564 Spark arresters. You'd like to understand a bit more about the ones typically used on the Japanese SL, and you're unsure of one of the aspects. The ones on those locomotives seem to be a small cage over the stack that spins, most likely by air pressure or steam driven. Why would this do this? Why would it provide an advantage? I don't even know. Uh, uh, I, can, I can answer this one, actually. If, if you've got it, you take it. Okay, so the top cover that you see on Japanese National Railway steam locomotives, that is not the actual um, arrestor. The arrestor itself is hidden inside of the smoke box itself. It's quite similar to what you see on DNRGW locomotives. Um, I'm not sure if you've shown off the equipment of 491. I have on the channel, any... yeah. Okay. Cyclone. If... Yeah, Cyclone. It's, it's very similar to that. It's a little different. The top componentry, I'm pretty sure the fan was actually included essentially as like a, a secondary blower. Oh, weird. Uh, JNR has some very weird choices. Uh, you'll see locomotives with a second headlight on the front because they're operating under electrified territory. So if the main bulb goes out, they can switch to the secondary uh, without risking the crew getting electrocuted. Um, but. And also, I believe those specs were mostly for Hokkaido and Kyushu, which are very drastic environments at times. So <laughs> it's it's less that's there for it's almost a, a secondary protection. Right. So it's it's not necessarily a spark arrest or what we see up there. That's potentially a second blower. Um, yeah. And, and not really a spark. Everything else is in the front end, um, whether it's a master Actually, mechanics or an Anderson where... or whatever. If you've got a, if you've got a good photo. if you've got a good picture I've of its got, reference, I mean, I just searched for yeah. Japanese locomotives. Because so. uh, there is there is a great Ooh. if you go to the museum in Otaru, Japan, um, which is on Hokkaido, they've got essentially most of the parts of a D fifty one disassembled. So there you can see that is quite strange. Yep, it is. It's very interesting. I mean, obviously the the netting would also act as a big spark arrester but that's yeah. uh that's bizarre then, i doubt i could get a drawing out from the c57 set no worries quick enough but huh. yeah essentially it's just got like a cyclone and it just it works well there you go <laughs> that's very neat all right let me see do we st we have a bunch of top chats that came in all right let's uh let's hit some of those bandan Thoughts on why the DNR GW never went for an error gauge articulated seems like they would have had a lot of drag freights with the mineral traffic because they were cheap fucks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what else to tell you. By the time that they were able to buy more locomotives kind of after the recession, they were trying to get rid of the narrow gauge. So it's just a timing thing. 
1928, they had the K-37s. 1930, K last of the K-37s. They kind of got all their power they need. 30s, depression, less traffic, blah, sad, whatever. 1940s, okay, maybe there's some money and stuff, but the war, so they can't buy new things, build new things. Okay, after the war, they're, they actively start trying to get rid of the narrow gauge. They tried to abandon it several times, um, and basically just got shoestrung along by it. The ICC saying like, no, you still have people to serve. And so they just kind of let the things go. And that's where the narrow gauge was run cheaply. Narrow gauge never did this. Narrow gauge didn't use ballast. Narrow, like all those myths came from that later era that we know of the Rio Grande when they were like just running it with no budget because they were trying to get rid of it. So, but yeah, had the timing worked out, if the depression wasn't in the 30s, I could have seen them going for the articulateds. So. Radioactive 4001. Am I excited for Simulator? Very much so. I watched uh, I watched Squirrel's video on the Steam Engine this morning, and uh, there's some stuff that excited me about it, and some stuff I was like, man, they were redoing this, and they didn't change that. Oh, but eh, it's okay. They focused on a lot of other, other quality of life things in a perfectly accurate Steam Engine. Um, I guess I will just never get in a train sim, <laughs> but it's fine. It's probably going to be the best train game we have for a while, so uh, I am excited for it. Emil Person, you should take a look at the video of a Swedish steam turbine locomotive pulling a heavy iron ore train. Yes. Yes, I should. Swedish steam turbine locomotive pulling a That sounds awesome. Yeah. If uh, one of you guys can find the link to that, that'd be, that'd be great. Feel free and DM it to me on Discord if you have Discord. Midland 1072 Productions, engineer for eight months. Hey, Heist, just wondering, when not riding in the cab, where is your favorite place to sit on a train? Coach, first class, caboose, etc. Uh, I like the comfy seats. Comfy seats are nice. Comfy seats where I can see the engine are nice. Uh, or or if the engine's like really working, as physically close to the locomotive as I can be. Uh, my favorite pastime at the Cumbres and Toltec is riding the front platform behind the tender um, with safety glasses or sunglasses or something on because you get pelted with cinders, but... Uh, the sound is religious. But if it's just a, a ride or whatever else, a comfy seat somewhere where you can see what the engine's doing. Let's see. Bird203. Heist, what do you use to clean the valve gear and regulator and the areas behind the Johnson bar and regulator to prevent dirt buildup? <laughs> Specifically in the cab? I mean, we'll wipe it down from once uh, once in a while and we'll, we'll hit it with the deck hose more often. That's really what you use to clean the cab is uh, a uh, there's a hose plumbed off the injector on the fireman's side on the Rio Grande engines. And when you start the injector working, you can open a valve and send some of the flow through this hose and wash things out that way. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the easiest way to do it. Scott Miller, brakeman for nine months. What skill did you wish you had for preservation? I wish I could weld. I have never welded. I've always wanted to learn. Never had a chance. Um, and there would be plenty. There's plenty of opportunities for that to get put put to, put to use. So, Zach, have I ever jammed on guitar while controlling a train? Not a real one. I have sat in the cab and played guitar, but not uh, not while the engine was running. Uh, fun fact: if you need uh, if you need 491 to build pressure while you're night watching. Apparently, vaguely Spanish guitar-sounding stuff uh, is uh, is what you need. So <laughs> it's like gauge wouldn't come up, gauge wouldn't come up, gauge wouldn't come up. E minor chords. Oh, hey, look, there it is. Gauge comes up. Oh, okay, it's fine. All right. Speaking of 491, I'm gonna get back to the uh, questions from the sheet here. Xanderman14 asks, why does 491 now run at 175 PSI, and will she ever go back to running at her original MAWP of 200 PSI? She runs at 175 because she does not meet the new law with uh, with her current design to run at 200, which is why she's at 175. Um, and so the, the details here is, after a certain incident in Pennsylvania, uh, we got a new boiler code. You know, because uh, contrary to what people who run meme pages may say, boiler codes are important. <laughs> and so are boiler standards because, I don't know, they're a bomb. So anyway, um, <clears throat> after we almost blew one up, uh, 
they came up with new standards. And previously, the old standard uh, under the ICC and National Boiler Code and everything was that you had to have an aggregate safety factor of four, which means that on average, you need to have a safety factor of four. So if you have a uh, if you have a patch or something and it's only got a safety factor of three and a half, so long as you had something that was four and a half somewhere else, eh, it's fine. That's cool. You can run that. And so the railroads operated under that. And so sometimes you'd have a safety factor of 3.8. Sometimes you'd have it as 4.2 and whatever. And so long as everyone was playing nice, that, uh, you know, that worked out. And, uh, well, the thing with minimum standards is that maybe they should be minimum and not allow for stuff like that. Because technically you could go down to like, well, a safety factor of 1.5 and safety factor of 7.5. And, and hey, look, that still averages out to 4, wink. Um so they changed it to a minimum safety factor of four. So you have to meet that safety factor of four at every single part of the boiler. Um, and 491 does not. And you probably are curious about the technical side. So it's time for paint.net. All right. 491. Let's see. Smoke box. First course. Oh, th those are square. Sure. Second course. Dome hole. Dome. That's not actually what a dome looks like, but we don't care about that part. Third course, firebox wrapper. Oh, God, it's not that tall. Whatever. You're going to get the idea. I can't draw. <laughs> anyway, so we have a thing, and we have a firebox in here, and it and it does things. Okay. So, oh, I did actually drew the – I drew the – okay. We're going to focus just on the back head so I can draw it right because that's, that's where the problem is. All right. So we have wrapper sheet and side sheet and whatever, and then firebox and stuff happens up there. Okay. We don't care. Everything up there is great. It's back here where we have the issue. So the back head on the 491 is, is kind of tapered back. I mean, it slopes like this, right? And so you have a corner at the bottom of the back head that gets really wide when you look at pictures. So like there's a really sharp radius up here curving from the straight to the back. And then there's a really big one back here. And when you have a really, really big radius right here with no stay bolts, because you can't have a stay bolt through this corner because the interior corner is pretty small in the firebox, you can't run bolts here. So there's no stay bolts in any of this area. And so steam is pressing on this sheet. If we we're to look at it from the top, I mean, it looks like this. And then at the very top of the boiler, it looks like this. And this was an early boiler design. This is 1902, remember, because it's uh, an old boiler from a standard gauge locomotive. So this was an early way to design what they called a self-supporting corner because it, it changed radiuses on the way up. It theoretically acts like a pyramid and is strong or something like that was kind of the thought of the design. Well, what happens is you end up having stay bolts, you know, on the actual side sheets to hold everything in place. But now you've got this big, 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 big moment arm all the way through here of all this steam pressing out uh, on this unsupported area, unstayed area. And so this steam out here is really acting with a really, really big lever, putting a torque on this bolt. Torque is just a, a force times a distance. And so you have a really, really big distance of unsupported whatever that that 200 PSI is acting on. And so 491 with, I think there's seven eighths or inch bolts back here. Those bolts are not strong enough to meet a safety factor of four. They actually only need to be sized up to like inch and a 16th, I think is what the Durango and Silverton did with the uh, 493. Sized up that row of bolts. It might be the first couple row of bolts. I don't remember because we did these calcs in like 2015, 2016 and haven't really looked at them since. Um, but that's the thing. This big unsupported corner, it gets a lot of the, that's the big reduction. If we fix these bolts and upsize these bolts to the right size, we can go to 192 instead of 175. And I think we will end up doing that when we do get to 491's rebuilds, because that's a pretty simple change. Um, and then that'll allow for more headroom. So, uh, because goodness, trying to keep 491 quiet at the museum at 175 with the siphons and everything, she makes steam like ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> it would be nice if we had a little bit more... Uh, a headroom to build steam without lifting the safety because the, the more pressure you get the harder it is to continue generating steam so it's a it's a lot easier to keep her quiet in the 190 range than the 175 range and then you also get more head headroom over the top of the air pump maximum or minimum pressure and everything and uh all kinds of good stuff 
But the other thing is, um, and I don't remember this near as well as I remember the, the bolt thing, so forgive me if I get this wrong. But we have the interior firebox here, and 491 is siphons. And siphons are basically a big pipe with a fin that runs up to the crown sheet. And the, the, it's like a pipe that like goes like this. And then the fin is also stayed. And if you look at them from the top, they're decently wide. That fin, maybe six, seven inches. So they had to omit a row of bolts there to make sure that everything could fit. And that was fine, and that actually maths out. And we have a hilarious Telegraph <laughs> series about this very thing because, uh, oh, we, we should tell that story. I haven't told it in a while. Um, <laughs> okay, so backing up, uh, Lynn Modinger from uh, formerly Strasburg, now East Broad Top, one of the guys who helped write the modern code. Sweetheart, Lynn's a great guy. He came out to help us out with the Form 4 and the 491 because he's he's got a soft spot for an error gauge and everything. And he came out to, to come see us and we had the jacket off and everything. And I did this UT survey and he was doing the math and kind of walked me through some of the math. Um, and there's just the one day where I'm doing UT measurements and, and Lynn's got his EBT hat on and he's counting rows of stay bolts on the outside. All these different bolts. If we look at uh, like a back view of the wrapper sheet and then the interior firebox, like that's oh, more like something like that. But you've got a bunch of rows of stay bolts like this, okay, that all radially go out. So you got a bunch of dots all across this that are bolt heads. And so he's counting the rows of stay bolts. And he's just going, okay, na, 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 and goes down in the boiler. And then he's there for a couple minutes, comes back out, scratches his head, goes and counts the rows of bolts again, goes back in the boiler. And he does this like three or four times. He comes out finally and just stares one last time and like very slowly counts the rows of bolts and just goes, well, this doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, what is it, Lynn? He goes, this engine's got more damn rows of bolts on the outside than it does on the inside. It's like, wait a minute, that do you can't, that doesn't, that doesn't work at all, okay? And so we searched through boiler records and whatever we could find, because we have all this stuff at the museum, and we found telegraphs back and forth from Burnham and Alamosa. 491 was getting the siphons installed in Burnham, uh, or no, in, in Alamosa, sorry, Colorado, at the division headquarters, big shop there. <clears throat> and Burnham, the big shop in Denver, was doing the, the stamping of the sheets because they had all the stamps and dies and everything to, to make all the boiler sheets for these. So Alamosa telegraphs Burnham and goes, hey, we need uh, the wrapper sheet, top wrapper sheet for the 491. Okay, well, we'll send it on a train down to, down to Alamosa. Sheet gets there and they punched it for a standard K37, not the siphon experiment. So they had two extra rows of bolts because remember these siphons, they take up that six inches. So you have to get rid of two rows of bolts like that bolt can't be there because it has nothing to attach to because there's a, a hole there where the siphon is and so they needed two of them removed two of the sets of bolts omitted but the sheet was already punched and this is kind of before welding was really a big thing particularly on pressure vessels she got the siphons in i think 38 depending on which paperwork you believe it's 38 or 48 They're, they got confused pretty sure it's 38 is what jeff uh, harps on these days um and so, <laughs> like, Alamosa basically called Burnham a bunch of dumb idiots in the Telegraph. I wish I remembered the ex exact language, but it was, like, pretty snippy. Like, you dumb dums, what did you do this for? So then Burnham, <laughs> Burnham writes back, like, after Alamosa goes, like, hey, please advise, what do we do? Burnham goes, we ran the tensile calcs on the wrapper sheet. Just plug the holes and send it. And so the Alamosa guys ran the bolts in like they were going to run the bolts in, peened the heads over, and then cut the shanks off with the torch. So it looks like on the outside that all the rows of bolts are there. But on the inside, they ground it flush. And you can't see. The, the, like, there's no shank. You can't tell that there was supposed to be a bolt there at all. <laughs> and we backed out the math. And for once, the Rio Grande did not have drunk math. And they were correct. And yes, you can do that and still run it at 200, which is hilarious, <laughs> even on the new law. So it's like, okay. All right, guys. So um, there's a hole in the engine. What do we do? Put a screw just, in it. Just literally put a screw in it. It'll be fine. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so stupid. But anyway, as a part of this, 
Um, and I don't, I don't remember exactly what it is. And we, I would probably have to chat with Lynn uh, and look at the paperwork again. But they also had to omit like two back head braces um, that run from the top and then hold the back head to shape. And that's where the last eight PSI uh, from 192 to 200 would be. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's why it does that. So, good question. Uh, the second question from Xanderman14. Does the museum want to plan to get 346 and or 491 FRA certified? You know, 491 can't go anywhere without a shit ton of money. You're just curious. 346 will be FRA. Um, 491 won't because there is literally no point and we're just adding a bunch of paperwork for ourselves. We already do the maintenance to that level of standard. Like all we're now doing is making like coordination with another body to hydro the engine again and like adding more rework. Um, so there doesn't really like, there's no reason. If she was going to go somewhere, we could do it, but like it's not worth it. So <laughs> Anyway, um, scrolling back up, I think I need to catch a little couple top chats here, uh, and then we can go to the asked questions here. <laughs> yeah, louder for the people in the back. Boiler codes are important. Yes, thank you, Brett. NSSR Railfan Brakeman for a month. Will I come to Duluth, Minnesota? Uh, yes, at some point, eventually. Not sure when. Blues Crew gifting 10 memberships. Why, thank you, Blues Crew. Let's see. Nazu, engineer for 12 months. There we go. Nice and golden green. Cheers, Heist. Cheers to you, mate. Thank you. Animal person, there's a link to the video of the Swedish steam turbine locomotive in the engine crew chat in Discord. Well, then, we will have to take a look-see at that in just a moment. Um, let me get through these top chats and we can take a quick look at it. Anon, why mouse? <laughs> Very good. Welcome to the ESD conductors. And let's see, is that it? Did it scroll down? I thought there was more than that. Okay, no, that's it. Okay, cool. Let's uh, let's see what this is about here. Time stamped and everything. Good man. Let's turn off the the music. Let's just listen to the choo choo. God, that's weird sounding. Cause that's just the air pump we're hearing. What the fuck's going on here? <laughs> I've never seen this a picture of this thing before. Oh, so the turbine so I... runs up there and it's geared down to then run the side rods, I guess? Yes, we uh, me and Spinotto and a few others in my server a few months ago while discussing the the Pensy turbine. Um which is its own can of worms. Right. Uh, stumbled upon this thing. And what I believe it is, is a similar concept, but some sort of weird, wacky uh, gearing system. So the steam gets used stupid efficient. This thing was a, like, hit success. This well, thing yeah. was great. Because the, the Penzi one wasn't geared quite right so like it had no power at start right because that like they didn't have any gearing setup so they're trying um, to like spin the turbine like i don't remember exactly what it was but no so the pensy turbine uh it, it, it had power when it started but problem is it just used a crap ton of steam oh, okay but once it got over about 20 miles an hour the steam efficiency was like double normal steam locomotives oh, god and the best part, you know what the best part about that engine is? What? They never hit top speed. They brought it to 110 miles an hour, and they got scared because it was still wanting to go a lot faster. The Depends theoretical on. top speed, do, having done the math, I think Andy did the math, and it could have gone upwards of 180 miles an hour. Good no God. sweat. Yeah. All right, Mallard, I... what you got? <laughs> This is a wacky looking thing. I'm glad that you sent this along, Emil. And it's so weird, like, you don't hear the... I assume that's the air pump running, not the, the turbine, right? Like, it sounds like an air pump. 
But I'm not I hearing any I'm sound from the turbine itself. Well, the turbines are incredibly quiet on these things. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially just spinning a fan. <laughs> it's... Spinning a fan with oh, God, you can hear it here. It just sounds like the blower's wide open. Yeah. That's so cool. I've never, I've never seen this engine or, or footage of an engine like it, really. I believe this engine is under restoration to operational uh, condition again. Super so cool. I run. <laughs> Super cool. Well, uh, gents, if you wouldn't mind entertaining the folks while I go take a tinkle, uh, I'll be right back. All right, <laughs> Fight Club. No, 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 no. We're starting the S2 Trust now. Yes, <laughs> Ultra. Oh, well, here's the thing. Again, that conversation sparked a lot of, like, theorizing between me and the people in my server. Um, and if there was a way to start the engine and get it up to i think it was 15 miles an hour which should be easy enough you could do that with some sort of crazy tender booster or whatever mm -hmm. um the s2 would have been the diesel killer the thing was stupid efficient but it was just the starting caused so much problem like and, and then the maintenance of the turbine itself was pretty bad. Um, yeah, it's not in like a super convenient position. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so much the position of it; they could take it out and maintain it. That wasn't exactly the issue. It was just they didn't have the parts to do it because it was a one-off. Yeah, if they had built a second one, or they had, or. I forget if it was a Baldwin. I think it was a Baldwin build. It was either Baldwin or Altoona build. It's one of the two. Um, but if they if they had you know documented it a little bit better, it would have been probably a little bit easier to get parts for. Yeah, um, I, I think build. it's I think it's interesting the story you mentioned of how fast it went on a confirmed run because I've heard the exact same story with the exact same speed figure told about the wj class when it uh, when it was being tested by the pennsylvania railroad uh this would be something for antimatter but yes i believe it was nnw 608 or 610 that did that it was Spe 610 speedy boy yeah. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm see. going to uh out myself as a norfolk and western j class enjoyer uh oh. And I'm going to cause a lot of controversy in the chat by saying that her 2015 whistle, the Hancock 3 chime, which she borrowed from 838 from Union Pacific, that was the best one which she's ever worn. Okay, fight. Uh, no, you're wrong. The one it has right now. <laughs> no. No. GNR 5 chimes. The one it has no. right now. No, the Our 2015 Hancock. The one it has right now. The 2015 Hancock is the angriest of them all. Angry means jack shit when compared to the sound. <laughs> I am talking about the sound. I'm talking about the, the the melody. I mean, if you listen to the one it's got right now, which I'm pretty sure is a retuned or dolled up version. Uh, How long is it going to take them to look at the uh, the stream video? I'm I can see it. it I'm time. choosing to ignore it. <laughs> I'm ignoring it. <laughs> We're having a civilized God. discussion that was, here, Mark. That was uh, given to me by, oh God, I can't remember his name. A wonderful man uh, at the East Broadtop, uh, who's uh, a long time for the channel. You were there. <laughs> he handed me that and I about died laughing. Uh, I'd have to go look up an email. I'm bad at faces and names, but uh, very, very, yeah, very silly cursed object. But you started talking about J-Class, so I mean... <laughs> Oh god, looking at the S2's back head is like... Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, no. It's so weird. Welcome to the submarine of locomotives. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> relevant topic, relevant topic. Oh, oh one thing is silly. <laughs> oh good god, that is a, that is a, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. It's, it's a lot of things. One it's whistle like, only. <laughs> yeah. You, you look at this, right? And then you have to realize that you can control the engine's motion with basically 
wasn't the Frottle and Revert and Johnson was, bar it combined? It was all one. It was all one. You would you would put push the bar forward to go forward, pull it back to go back. It was so weird. I love it. Wacky. Pennsylvania Railroad, the standard railroad of the world that followed not even their own standard. <laughs> they were okay. finding the new standards. And but it's got cab signals! It does have cab it's signals. Got cab signals. Yeah, All right, I'm going to hit some top chats, then we're going to get back to questions here. Uh, let me know if you guys have any good ones uh, from the, the live chat as well once I get through the top chats. Super Blue Hedgehog, conductor for three months. Three months first as a conductor. Question, any tips for someone trying for a freight conductor for class one? Uh, make sure you can lift 50 pounds, don't do drugs, uh, and have a pulse. There you go. Uh, Emil Person, the best part about these steam turbines is all three built have been preserved. That is kick-ass. That's super good. That's awesome. Let's see. Chat, if you would just let me scroll without jumping around, that would be great. Washington Rail Fan, conductor for three months. So glad to see Heist doing office hours. Also, the conductor B-roll footage is amazing. I'm glad. Uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the most recent B-roll. The, the Bev roll. <laughs> Bev. So good. Oh, man. We, we still... Do, do we do we want to watch uh, do we want to watch a little, a little, little clip of uh, me being very confused from the next season of three quarter show <laughs> they all started singing and I didn't know what to do it's very good Jersey did, were you there last night when I showed it to your server you might not have been oh no you might have gone night night already I'll, I'll, I'll start pulling that up because we uh, we talked about uh, three quarter show and things. Anyway, Daylight PNW Productions. Speaking of safety, most steam locomotives should be up to code. But have you ever questioned a locomotive for safety concerns, boiler, running gear, or etc.? Yes, God, yes. Yeah, I fired a bomb once. <laughs> Didn't know it was a bomb, but uh, found out it was a bomb later, and uh, it's out of service now. So anyway, um, running gear <laughs> conditions. Yeah, I mean running gear is like not as big of a deal, but yeah, definitely seen some questionable stuff uh you know sometimes uh sometimes that stuff happens so anyway brent hinshaw fireman for 13 months can't stay for long just wanted to pop in for your milestone message and remind everyone that nyc 999 did it first speedy boy yes let's see okay Sack M slash Panda Fireman for six months. You should, you see, they called it standard, so everyone would ignore the Q1 streamlining. Uh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Rudy Garbly, welcome to the conductors. And Modius. Modius? I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that. Anyway. Hey, Heist, have some of my money. Well, thank you. It also comes with a question How does the air pump from, how does the air from the pump on 491 go to the right air tank? Oh, it just uh, it goes over a little hoop. Let me see if I got a picture. Is a, a U pipe that runs over the top of the the boiler. Do I have a convenient picture of 491? I might. I might not. We'll have to see. Yeah, all of the K's have uh, basically a U pipe from the radiator piping uh, that then runs over to the second tank. And I'm not gonna have a super. Oh, okay. Well, this picture would actually probably show it. Okay. So here's 491. Uh, obviously the pump's on the other side, but this pipe here, that's actually main reservoir. So it's right right at the front edge of the boiler, right before the smoke box. It runs over this little bracket on top that holds it in place. Um, and then that feeds to this side of radiator piping. No, does it feed to the radiator pipe? No, it feeds to the top end of the radiator piping. And then it goes into the tank from there. And then it actually draws off and gets used by all the air brake equipment at the other end of the reservoir. So this is all at, you know, 130, 140 PSI uh, charged up main reservoir. So, good question. Oh, I managed to turn my camera off. <laughs> what, what is smoking off camera? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, don't worry about that. It's the, the Lionel smoke generator. You know, you got to get high on that Lionel stuff. No, it's uh, my humidifier. <laughs> That's my humidifier. Okay. We're okay. snorting smoke fluid today. <laughs> no, um, it's got realistic chuffing noise. No, I've got uh, a humidifier in the room because Colorado is hella dry and I have guitars. Uh, so, you know, details. Valid. Let's see. Is it is it this clip? All right. Let me let me see. Is it is it this clip that they started singing? It might be this clip. No, I don't think it was this clip. 
I gotta find the. Uh, th- there was a moment in the three quarter show filming last for this most recent season where all three of the contestants just started singing, and I was left being very confused. Okay, but which one was it? What clip was it? I should have written it down. I found it last night, and it was just like, oh my god. Is this the one that Goose was telling me about? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Here it is. I have found. I have found it. All right. So spoilers for this uh, upcoming season of the Three Quarter Show. Or spoilers, we have Goose uh, as our guest, and we're at Layton's house. Here we go, folks. This is uh, this is a beautiful thing. Let's see. I play with you, please. Here. Yes. Um, Layton, elaborate more on the Franklin expedition. Where did those engines come from exactly? Locomotive railways. Ah, uh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage sink to find the hand of Franklin reaching. What is going on? See, tracing one warm line through a land so wide and savage, to take a Northwest Passage to. See. I'm assuming somewhere in there you're just gonna cut with like a <laughs> screen, you know, technical difficulties, and then we come back to here. Yeah, never heard that song before. <laughs> Did we just break part of it. It's just like, wait, okay, he know, he know. What? How do they all know this movie? <laughs> Westward from the day is straight. No, so we're not doing it anymore. We're not doing it anymore. Silence. No. <laughs> Air writer <laughs> and make me deaf in the process. Malt. Malt. Cockatoo sounds are loud, everyone. Malt. Lord God Almighty. Uh, All right, so yeah, we uh, we f- finished the episode, and then and then they did it again at the outro. So. Neater, 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 neater. Now go away! I'll so punch you in a second time. All right, then fuck you. Westward from the Davis Strait, was there, was said to lie. The credits are rolling, but that's the route to the <laughs> Orient. When, when did it become a so thing? Died, seeking gold and glory, leaving <laughs> weathered broken bones, and the long forgotten lonely care of stones. Ah, for <laughs> just one time, I would take the Northwest okay. Passage. I think, I think you've got it by now. I think we get the end of the credits. Christ. <laughs> yeah, so uh, apparently those are songs from Stan Rogers. Uh, and I was not initiated <laughs> on this at all, as you can see by me being like, okay, Leighton and Goose are both singing it. And then Brett starts singing it, and I just do the... The confused cat zoom back face. <laughs> the, the final face. Oh my Just... god. Someone clip that. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, um, yeah, that, uh, that whole clip. That's good. I'm going to have to put that up for conductors just as raw as it is. Because uh, we're going to have to edit probably some of that at some point. Oh, this is going to be so fun. It's going to be, it's going to be a shit post. I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, so yeah, anyways, <laughs> back to office hours. <laughs> oh, good God. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Craig Bryant, can you explain what tractive power is? Also, what is the max or the 491 maximum amount of cats can pull during its heyday. Oh goodness, maximum amount of cats? Well, it de- I mean that de- that that depends on a lot of different factors. I don't know. That's uh I don't know if I could, if we could do the math for that question. What is what is the rolling resistance of a cat? We're going to have to experimentally figure that out. Um tractive power. I mean, I I'm curious if you mean tractive effort or tractive power because power and effort are two different things um i guess the the quick thing is tractive effort is the literal maximum force that a locomotive can like pull um and 
power is a measurement of how quickly you can create a certain force. So like horsepower in your car, um, you get more horsepower with more RPM up to a certain point. Basically, the, the principle is the more faster you can make that piston move with the same amount of like force on the piston, the more horsepower the car has. The faster you can spin the crank, the more times you get that power stroke of that strength per second is the, the more power, which is why it's like, okay, well, my car's got 400 horsepower, just like super easy. And then you look at 491 and 491's only got like a thousand horsepower because you really can't spin that crank that's attached to a wheel that's 44 inches in diameter. You can't really spin it that fast, uh, you know, because that's, uh, that's the whole thing. Um, so power is not necessarily a great, like, discrete measurement for a steam locomotive because there is no way to gear it down and get the engine to run at speed compared to the the physical wheels itself um so you know a steam locomotive doesn't end up having a lot of power when it may actually have a significant amount of force uh, which is the tractive effort not the physical actual power that it's making tractive effort is a calculation literally that says i can pull this much force at my coupler so when you, if you were to hook up a force gauge to the 491 between a bumping post and the rear coupler, it would put out, if it was at 200 PSI, it would put out about 37,000 pounds on that gauge, which translates to more than 37,000 pounds of car because you have to pull that much rolling resistance of a car. And so it's actually a lot easier to move like a 50 ton car than 50 tons, right? Because 50 tons is whatever, 200, 200,000 pounds something no 100,000 pounds I can do math I'm an engineer I promise um, <clears throat> 100,000 pounds that's like three times the tractive effort but 491 can pull a ton like a bunch of 50 ton cars because the rolling resistance is a lot less because we have nice bearings and things and, and whatnot uh, and so getting that weight started all the weight presses down it doesn't necessarily resist you from moving um, so that's what tractive effort versus like power is. Power is how quickly you can spin the spin that crank. And with a steam engine, it's also kind of a bad measurement because the faster you start to spin the crank, the less you can actually have full pressure on the piston. So you can't actually have maximum tractive effort at higher speeds. Um, like uh, there was a, a great study done with the 315 uh, that I think is in 315's book that talks about how it develops max maximum tractive effort at about 10 miles an hour. And so if you're hauling tonnage, you're going to be doing it at 10. If you slow down, you know, you're going to be a little bit less efficient or whatever. Um, and, and you get less power strokes, so you get less power, but you still can put that force down slower. But if you speed up, you start losing that force. So though you're increasing the speed of the crank, you're no longer pulling that force, which is actually what's moving the train up the hill. So whether or not you're making more power, you actually can't pull it faster. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. Power is not actually necessarily, in a mechanical sense, a super helpful measurement uh, when we're talking about big machines and big engines like this. So anyway, hopefully that helps. <clears throat> Jack Morgan, I sent a photo in train crew. Thoughts on your great-great-grandfather's choo-choo. He's the one leaning out of the cab. Well, let's take a look. Train crew, Jack Morgan. Uh, you're looking for the one. Uh, the, 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 uh, the 927, the locomotive? Yes. Oh, I believe. that's a Lackawanna engine. That's cool. That's nice. Looks like a stand up chap with a big mustache. And that is, that's neat. That's like early, 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 early 19th century, or uh, early 20th century, I would have to guess. Maybe late. Uh, <laughs> late 19th century because we've got the the round case light and we still got fluted domes it's still got like light amount of lining it's too bad armagon just left he would love to look at this and you still got smoke box cleanouts which a lot of railroads got rid of which is neat big drivers big big honking 440 but you can see how how shallow or like what how short the uh the stroke is with how close to the crank it is oh and it's got split counterweights that's wacky that's cool. On the on the tail driver, on the main driver, it looks like it's uh, all the way there, but it's got a split counterweight on the rear driver, which is weird. That's a neat choo-choo. That's really cool that you got that picture of him, too. That's awesome. Jetnik. 
connector for 12 months just what you needed to soothe your worn out soul today has not been a good day oh, i'm sorry to hear that man hopefully we can provide uh, some entertainment for you washington rail fan take some money for b-roll well thank you a blinken welcome to the conductors thank you oh cars not cats <laughs> Okay. That makes, I thought I thought it was a shit post of a question. Okay, right. <laughs> okay, we can do that, Matt. Uh, we're not gonna hurt cats today. <laughs> we're not we're not hurting cats today. Although that's oh. um, that's that's gonna have to be a video at some point. Okay, uh, cat cars. How many cars can it do? Uh, and tractive effort. So we talked about tractive effort. Uh, gave that explanation. I appreciate you top chatting again. Uh, here's my spreadsheet for uh, a cursed video game of cursedness. But I I'd use this is a very simplified back of the napkin way to calculate out rolling resistance of a train. Um, there are much more sophisticated models out there. But this is what a lot of railroads would have used back in the day because they weren't trying to go right up to the marker. They were trying to get pretty close ballpark. So it's called the Cole method, um, and it's basically how many pounds per ton or pounds per pound of resistance you have. Rolling resistance, right? So for every ton of weight, you have eight pounds of resistance. So that 50-ton car on level track, um, oh, that's right, Microsoft uh, Excel decided to deactivate itself because licensing problems, so I can't do the math in here. Anyway, 50-ton car you would have 50 times eight, which is uh, a number. That's a number, F uh, eight, uh, that's four, 400, 400, yes? No, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 or 400, 400, 400, yes, no, 40? 400, because it's, it's five times eight is 40, and then you add a zero. Right, that one, thank you. Uh, I can't do math on live stream. Like live stream brain is not conducive to doing math. Thank you. 400, right, for that 50 ton car. So the rolling resistance, though it weighs 50 tons, is actually only 400 pounds, right, for a 50 ton car. Um, and then that's just on straight level track. For every percent of grade, you add 20 pounds per ton. And for every degree of curve, you add 0 0.8 pounds per ton. So as soon as you go up a percent grade, you've more than doubled, you know, what, what you have to pull, almost tripled it, really. Um, so if you're on straight and level track, 491, 37,000 pounds. Uh, I mean, well, when it was brand new, now she's less than that. 37,100 pounds divided by 400. She could haul 92 and three quarters 50 ton cars on straight and level track. So almost 93 big 50 ton box cars. And she probably never pulled that much, actually. But flat and level track, that is what this says she can do. Uh, obviously, you get some grade percentage in there. Uh, very quickly, that disappears. So if we have 50-ton cars, and let's say it's a 4% a grade, right? So we have 8, and then we have 20 times 4, because 4%. So each car is actually adding um, 88 pounds per ton, right? So then that's 50, that's 4,400 and then 37,100 divided by that 4,400. Uh, she could only haul eight of them up a 4% grade. So huge difference. And that and that's kind of the way it goes. You just add up those resistances. So hopefully that helps. <clears throat> I did a little bit more explanation of that whole concept in a steam versus diesel. Why horsepower is not uh, the thing um, video back in like January, maybe. Hey, I've got good news. Uh, it appears we have gained some wings, but a Apparently, there's some strings attached. Uh-oh. <laughs> I, I hate it when there's strings attached. I thought they pulled the strings. I thought they were the god emperor of, of the universe. God emperor. <laughs> the, the god emperor. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I got a bunch of top chats to blitz through real quick here. <clears throat> Yearly Gymnast 98. Guten Tag, all. Glad to see stream uh, to relax after prepping to move to college. Your query today is what are the top three worst things to maintain on steam and diesel motive power? Oh, that's a great question. Three worst things to maintain. Um, God. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I mean, they're all <laughs> my brain just goes, well, that sucks. That's God. They all kind of suck. They're all kind of a challenge. If I had to do off the top of my head without too much thought though, um, the least fun jobs are like pulling the superheater header on a superheated engine. That sucks. Bunch of steps to get there. Um, 
punching tubes always sucks, like cleaning out the flues. Um, particularly when you have arch breaking, you got to take the brick arch out too. Like that sucks. Oh, and oh, the grates. Maintaining the grates on a coal burner because they work harden and they heat cycle harden. Like trying to grind the back into place or even reinstall new grates. Like that just sucks. Everything about that sucks. That's probably the worst thing, especially the K37 with the god awful ash pan. Um, on diesel, um, I always heard complaints about changing the brushes on the traction motors from all my employees. I never did it, but that sounded like it sucked. Um, drop table work always was kind of hot, hot and heavy and shitty, uh, dropping traction motors out, which I'm sure would be the same on a steam engine too, but uh, with dropping wheel sets and taking rods off and stuff. But uh, I've never gotten to drop a driver set out of a steam engine. Um, oh, and then probably doing the, the main alt bearing on an EMD. That that always looked like a crappy job. Um, the AR-10 bearing for the D14 for the alternator. Um, watching those guys. I mean, they would... It, it, it was crazy. You had to press it off. Yet there's a billion steps and to actually do it. And the electricians and the machinists would have to work together, take all the brushes off, pull everything apart, get the actual bearing off that for the slip ring where you actually generate power. Um, it's a lot of work. So any of the uh, the shop folks who've actually been there done that. Uh, that's not a terribly fun one. <clears throat> so uh, th th those are top off the top of my head. I'm sure there's actually worse things, and I would think of them uh, later. But off the top of my head, those are uh, those are a list of about six shitty tasks to do. So, Stephen Sash Sash Saxy. I don't know how to pronounce your name. My apologies. <laughs> what? Good evening. What's the thing behind the Alamosa 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 thing? So we j we joke. Um, the steam engines when they chuff, they chuff in sets of fours. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right. And ev everyone you talk to will will have some sort of different moniker for like their version of what that is. Like I remember going to ride at the Mount Rainier Scenic riding behind engineer Tim Daubert on the 17. And we get get out of the station, get through the first crossing. <clears throat> and he starts opening up on the throttle. And he just leaned back to me and he goes, woof a chucka, woof a chucka, woof a chucka. And it's just like, oh, I haven't heard that one before, you know, but it's four things, four syllables, woof, uh, chuck, uh, or I've, I had one guy that just liked to go bang, 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 just like, oh, okay. Everyone's got their own little, uh, little fun thing. And the one that we've come up with most recently is, uh, if, if you would get one throttle notch too many on 491, she would want to like take off and go to the races. Cause you really, you're really not opening that valve far at the museum most of the time. So if you accidentally grabbed one too many, she'd start picking up, start going. It's like, no, you're not going to Alamosa, sweetheart. Alamosa being her old division headquarters far away. And you couldn't get there on the three foot gauge anymore. But back in the day, uh, actually even before 491 ran, uh, she couldn't run from Denver to Alamosa, but point is like this would be that would be running fast running home would be going to alamosa so we always joked oh she wants to go fast she's gonna go to alamosa and then of course alamosa is four letters or four syllables so it turned into alamosa alamosa ala and there you go <laughs> mean metal mike breakman for five months two engineers walk into a bar and yells grandma i mean I, that, yeah sure yeah <laughs> Tyler McGonagall. Hey, I don't have a lot to give this time. No worries, man. I appreciate you guys no matter what. Like, this, We're just here to have fun. Your fun car blew its motor. That sucks. That's never fun. I'm knocking on wood while I say that. You're sorry, Brett. Maybe next time you can arrange for more nuggies. <laughs> Love y'all. Right? Craig Bryant. I'm just curious on your thoughts. Will there be any kind of big or small comeback of brand new steam engines will be built in the United States of America? Uh, Maybe... Maybe if uh, people get crazy and want to new build locomotives, but like not I mean, like in revenue service. We're already kind of in a renaissance where like so many narrow gauge locomotives that we didn't think would come back did come back. Right. Like SP18, RGS20, um, 168. Like we're we're having yeah. like a, a 493. New era of, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. just a lot of stuff coming back that wouldn't have happened ten years ago. Right. So on the topic of brand new steam, uh, shark nose. Shark nose. No. We are we are just <laughs> again duck for dinner, folks. Duck for dinner. Yeah. Casmon, hey guys, can you explain when power, torque, and tractive effort is the best metric? 
Uh, in terms of railroading, tractive effort is almost always the best metric. Um, and, and and I'll like a lot of people will say horsepower matters more these days, um, but I would still say tractive effort is what matters because um, because of the whole C four thing, right? So um, BNSF has some six axle diesels that are big road power, and they call them like an ES forty four C four, which means that it's a big 4400 horsepower locomotive but it's only got four traction motors and it's got two idlers so it only has four motors but six axles whereas a normal es44 is six traction motors and anyone who's ever run both of them will tell you that you can't get any pulling power out of the c4 despite it being the same horsepower and despite the the books and the manufacturers saying you get the same horsepower and can get that amount of horsepower down to the tracks with four traction motors it just does not, you don't get the adhesion, you don't get that tractive effort translated, no matter what. And so the tractive effort of a C4 versus a regular ES44 is less, though the horsepower is the same. And the horsepower is kind of decoupled from the whole thing, because you're talking about the horsepower of the diesel engine, which is spinning a giant alternator, which is then supplying current. So it's kind of like, okay, well, horsepower is really not a great measure for diesel locomotives either. Um, it is a little bit easier to compare to like a car guy or right. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, I've got 4,400 horsepower in this thing. It's like, Holy shit. That's a lot of power. Yeah. When you're sending pistons, the size, you know, that you could stick your head down the bore, you know, <laughs> and sending them spinning at a thousand RPM ish. Uh, yeah. You tend to generate a lot of horsepower just cause the torque is so high. Um, uh, but for like locomotives, I mean like tractive effort's going to be the thing. Um, if you're trying to pull stuff and you're directly mechanically coupled, like, like in a car, um, torque is really the best thing in terms of like roadway usage and stuff. And if you need to get up and go, then power is the best. If you're talking about a, a drag racing car, you want to talk about horsepower. Um, or if you're talking about electricity, you want to talk about power, not in horsepower, but in Watts. Um, and you can convert horsepower to Watts, which is hilarious, but uh, cause it really feels like they should not be used for the same things, but, oh God, who let this guy in here? We, we, we should measure, oh, no. we should measure locomotive output in Aga Duggas. Aga Duggas. Hey man, that's how I do my maintenance. <laughs> I, well, hold, I just wanted to, I wanted to mention one thing. You're talking about horsepower and I thought this was interesting and I actually had a legitimate engineering question. Why don't they talk about locomotives in terms of work? Because work is the force you can apply over a distance. And that seems like it would be a more reasonable thing for a locomotive because the work would be constant for the engine, right? If it can apply, you know, 2,000, 10,000 joules of work or whatever, it would be like gigajoules or whatever, right? But right. if you can apply that many joules over, you know, that's an actual useful unit because you could say, hey, this this engine can actually output, you know, this amount of force over this distance, which would apply to the weight of a huge ass train, right? So, like that so would... you're, what you're making makes sense to me as an engineer, but I have to, I hate to break it to you, Khan. But the major locomotive manufacturers have always been in America. So it's horsepower. So it's horsepower. <laughs> so uh, cheeseburgers per out. freedom uh, per gallon yeah. of diesel. Yeah. Like, uh, we'll hey, man, measure... I can give you 6,000 freedom horses for, you know. The, well, that's the... basically what a horsepower is because it's not actually yeah. the power of a fucking horse. No, it's 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 way more than the power of a horse. Uh, no, it depends. Like the, the burst power you could get out of a horse is apparently like three or four horsepower, but the actual sustained applied power is like it's like only a tenth of a horsepower, depending on the yeah. horse too. So I mean, ah, damn you, James Watt. I mean, also at the end of the day, it doesn't matter horsepower, tractive effort, drawbar pull, what the railroad is using on a day to day is. How many high side gongs are we getting over Marshall Pass today? Yes, and they then they go by their table. So, <laughs> Brain cannon. What's their What's the load factor on railroads? Like for tonnage, how much? How many? How many engines do they run over for? Like, do they run two to one, one to one, one point five to one? Do they care? So the the railroads these days. I mean, and this has always been kind of the way that the railroad runs is they they know what their track does, they know what the subdivision does each direction. Like, like Wings was saying, a Marshall Pass. Okay, it's this steep. We know that, okay, this class engine can take this many tons, blah, 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 blah. Um, and in the modern day, because we just now work in bricks of 4,400 horsepower, they look for horsepower per ton rating. And so on the flat, you might be talking like, on the track, you might be talking like on a flat railroad, half a horsepower per ton. 
So if you got, you know, 8,800 horsepower, okay, one locomotive or 8,800 tons, one 4,400 lo- or horsepower locomotive could take that and, and do what it needs to do on the track. And they've kind of figured that out and they know, okay, well, this hill, like scenic, um, up and over scenic um, in Washington out of my shop. They wanted like two and a half horsepower per ton in the winter when it was rainy and snowy and crappy. And they wanted like two horsepower per ton during the summer or whatever. But otherwise, you know, going south out of Seattle, not going over the big hill was only like one or 1.1 horsepower per ton. Um, so you you just figure out the weight of the train and then you slap enough shit boxes on the front until you have enough power. So, yeah. Uh, for example, I threw an MOW VC text, the CNS's clear creek and platte canyon oh yes the, the, these yes i'm glad that you just have these on at the ready <clears throat> yeah so you can see what the cookies can do which is funny the cook moguls can do the same in most of these ratings as some of the baldwin consolidations that's funny it's a bit absurd yeah well to be fair like you're saying 270 tons from denver to golden this is it, it's so i'm seeing that it says like modern diesels they're like 4000 horsepower right 4400 yeah right but they generate over 60000 pound feet of torque well yeah big big honk and diesel engine man they spin yeah. those cranks slow i mean the yeah. the, the, the the ge 9s topped out at 1050 rpm and then the emds topped out at like at 1050 nine, 900 like yeah 1050 that was full throttle yeah, yeah and then the emds crazy. 900 two stroke but 900 rpm was the fastest they went so yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah these charts i mean this is this is the whole thing and then you figure out okay well how many tons are the cars and then okay you do the math as long as you don't exceed this you know that that engine could get over that chunk of railroad and if it was this over, is still you a person doing tons. the charts in modern day like this is still a person planning out every schedule or is it like more automated now oh i'm sure i mean it's still somewhat up to the people like one of the most interesting things that you end up with is like these charts have been established for like no one's building new routes at this point really um that commonly on the railroad right but somebody would still do the math figure it out whatever okay this is this railroad and then adjustment factors is needed based on curvature or weather or something uh humans would figure these out but then it's up to humans to then make sure that the trains get made up that way and that was one of the most interesting and political calls on the railroad every day was the the call with the power desk uh for bnsf down in fort worth it was called the uh the amlu or the mlu yeah the managers of locomotive utilization uh slang term the power desk were the people that managed where all the locomotives were going across the system and they had their own territory and they would see, okay, there's five trains coming into Seattle, two from the North, three from the South, whatever. They have this many engines. Now what trains do those engines need to get turned around and put back onto going away that we have originating? What do we have cars for? And they would call the roundhouse us and the, and the yard all at the same time. And everyone would talk. Okay. Well, what, what engines are we planning to put on what trains? What can we put together? Who can come from where to go where, um, and it was always just the dumpster fire of all time because it's like th- the railroad never had never had what it needed right at the right time. It'd be like, well, we're short six locomotives and we're not getting any more coming into the town, you know, until tomorrow. And these trains are high priority and they can't leave and there's no power for them. What do we do? And the power desk's like, well, maybe we can rearrange and do this, do this. Maybe we can run one, one light or something, blah, blah, blah. Uh, always arguing, always figuring it out, and everyone always had an opinion and and whatever. And and we were the the black uh, black sheep of the family at the roundhouse, where we provided switch engines that added more tonnage but not more power to their trains. <laughs> they were just getting towed dead back to whatever uh, <laughs> spot on the railroad they worked out of. Uh, so once in a blue moon, you know, you'd, you'd listen to the power desk in the yard be arguing back and forth, and be like, "Man, shit, we're fucked. We can't get this out. We're not gonna have power, whatever." And then I could just sit there and be like. I have one road unit ready for you. That's all you need. You needed one. I've got it. And they're like, oh my God, you saved the railroad. <laughs> Yay, we did. We did the thing. Have, have the one horse, you know, the one engine that they actually cared about. And then you do that too often. And then they're like, hey, Roundhouse, can you bail us out? And it's like, no, I have 50 locomotives at the shop and they're all turds. <laughs> <laughs> 
You broke that one last week, Jeff. Yeah, basically. God. Yeah, when are we going to have that back? Well, let's see. If you didn't slide all the wheels flat. Yeah. So, yeah. Torque, uh, oh. torque power, attractive effort. Yeah, those are uh, neat neat things. Uh, do you have any more pre-asked questions? Oh, I've got a, I've got a crap pile, and I've still got uh, more top chats. We're going through top chats, so let me let oh, me geez. catch up on all the top chats here because uh, I'm worried about the, the, them running away here. All right, all right well, I have to go uh, uh, build do the, scrap mechanic things. Do so. the next thing, yes. Go, go have yeah, fun. Yeah, no, I just, I just felt, it felt like interrupting because you were talking about horsepower. We were and, talking about engineer things, yes. Uh, yeah, I always like you know a good. A good torquing, if you know what I mean. Oh, I mean no. we, should, uh, we should torque together some. Oh, he left. Oh, <laughs> dude. Slight concern. Anyways, that's, it's fine. That's he got for away. my server. Don't, uh, don't even, don't even, don't even worry about it. Consent. I can Why don't I have the power to drag sits up? That's stupid. Oh, I have to. I had to unfold the thing. Now I can do that. Look, welcome. Anyway. <clears throat> Jordan Freeman just joined the live stream. Have you answered my question? Thank you for the top chat. I don't believe we've gotten to yours in the asked questions because I think you were pretty early and I was just going in the order that I copied and pasted them. Let me see if I can scroll through and grab it real quick while we're here. Yes, Jordan Freeman 166. If I were to use some of the advanced Steam technology advocated by Porta on your girls, what technology would I choose and why? Also, petition Heist to tie all his hair gray so you can play Santa at this year's Polar Express. No. Hard no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as the Porta stuff, uh, he did so many neat things and was experimenting with so many neat things, a lot of which are kind of convoluted to do. Um, I don't know... I don't know what I would want to use like the, like some of the gas producer firebox stuff and some of the, like the, the greats shaking themselves with the valve gear kind of crap like that. You, you would not, you would not make a way for that to work on the, the any of our choo choos. Uh, one that would be interesting for me to try, I think would be to do uh, the, the limpor exhaust with the, the dedicated nozzles for each, uh, each blast and everything. That could be interesting, and I know that's been modified to some engines to some success. Um, I mean, we're not going to because we're a museum and we're, we're going to run it historically. But that would be uh, that would be the one interesting and and a little bit simpler thing to try. I think so. Anyways, good question. CJ Carthy Five, have you seen the game Railroad or Shortline Operations? Any photos of the UP engine out running you would like to see? Uh, I have seen that that game is going to be a thing. Obviously, we're uh, anxiously awaiting Railroader to save us from the pit of crappy train sims and praying that it won't be crappy. Um, and photos of the UP engine out running that you'd like to see. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I mean, if it's the big boy, I mean, if they're cool pictures, I like seeing cool pictures. So there you go. Jack Morgan, also family who helped build Marias Pass and who worked for Erie out of Hornell. He was des you were destined to love trains. For the coke and the condensing questions in Train Crew, you posted a loco that did both. Well, cool. Where's that one? Okay, that's right there. Oh, so this is oh, this is super early. And it's uh it's for the underground. Wacky. I think it also had some weird thing with the way that it exhausted where it would send it into like a box or it would send it somewhere that's to not smog out the air. Oh, okay, that's what that is. That's you, you see the big pipes that go back. Yeah, into that's the so that's a big yeah, that's weird. That. Oh, well, that is super weird. And it burned coke. Well, that's but like I said, <laughs> I don't know, probably. Oh, I wasn't showing my screen this whole time. Probably. Um yeah, and here you go. Yes, yes indeed. They did. They did do that. That's so neat. And with the roller coaster tycoon inspired steam dome cover. <laughs> I know it's not roller coaster tycoon inspired, it. but it's, it's what it makes me think of because I'd never seen one in real life other than in the in roller coaster tycoon. Inclined cylinders and everything. It. Wacky. Only having a spectacle plate, but at the same time, it's running in a tunnel. So the tunnel roof is kind of already your roof. Right. Yeah. That's fun. Thank you for that reference, Jack. That's awesome. Oh, while while I'm here and seeing it, Ronald Gallagher, uh, I think. Sorry. Speaking of alternator, what's the difference between an alternator and a generator? 
a generator generates electricity just by spinning and mechanical things happening. An alternator needs to be excited before it will create more electricity. So a generator, just, just by existing, creates the power as it spins. Uh, an alternator takes existing power and then basically kind of amplifies it. Um, to, for layman's terms, it's not really what's happening, but you have to have an electrical excitation for an alternator to work. And alternators are easier to make lots of power with uh, in a smaller package than a generator at that same level. Early EMDs had generators, um, and almost everything is an alt these days because... Uh, I mean, the, the size and the amount of electricity they're trying to produce, even fitting within the box that a American diesel locomotive is, which is huge, takes uh, takes a lot of space. So alternators work a little bit better. Colton Taylor at the National Railroad Museum. Your open car air car's rear left side flange and goes, me! squeaking around the loop. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I've got a couple flanges that do that too. William Grantham, the engineer for 13 months. G'day, g'day. Fine. Glad to finally be able to catch another live stream. Any word on the distribution of the redacted for the engineers? I'm still collecting uh, I'm still collecting names and addresses. I need to ping people again. Um, if you're an ESD engineer uh, and you want uh, sweet custom things that only ESD engineers are going to get, uh, make sure you DM me or email me your name and address and shipping and, and things. Um, because uh, I need to get with Leighton on getting those ordered relatively soon here. So, but uh, I'll update uh, more when I get because uh, I only have about half of them, I think. So, Sir Liv, thoughts on the passing of Howard Jones and the end of the wool? Oh, I can't pronounce that. That looks Czech or Polish. It's Polish. Pol Wolst Wolston Steam Experience. If you made a deal with the devil, what would you do to save steam for the 21st century? Um, I'm not familiar with Howard Jones or the the Wollstone, perhaps Steam Experience, um, so I don't I don't have too many thoughts on that. That's a bummer to hear about, though. Uh, if that uh, if that's what it is, and if I made a deal with the devil, what would I do to save Steam for the 21st century? I mean, we're we're doing the best that we're doing, like at least in the states, the best we've done in preservation in a long time these days. Um, and the best thing we can do is to try and get more people involved and learning and learning and understanding the importance of the safety pieces that we know and uh, learning the, the details of what makes these things really tick um, so that they can kind of take the hold because the people who got trained by the generation that did this are, are almost gone um, and everyone now is second or third generation like uh, trained from steam you know removed like me like I got trained by a guy who was removed from steam entirely and and was, you know, <laughs> trained by guys that removed, like, I'm third generation away from the real steam railroaders kind of thing. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, getting folks involved is the thing to do. Would I make a deal to, with the devil to do that? I mean, if I had to. <laughs> but uh, uh, I would challenge him to a rock battle first, a la Tenacious D. So <laughs> before I made well, that well, deal. That, well, it would just be a tribute. It would just be a tribute. Jutnik, you'd love if I did some videos about some of the lesser known European steam locomotives, you know, give the American railway man's perspective on them. One of these days, and, and we'll get, we'll get, uh, we'll get there. One of the things that I do want to do that has been a great suggestion is I want to get together with the discord, maybe have somebody like Jersey help put it <laughs> together. Um, people keep talking about like, Hey, can we like, let's send the most crazy cursed weird one-off locomotives and have you rank them or something. Like if, if we could compile a list and make a thing, I would happily stream that and have fun with that. Um, and we'd, we'd see many lesser known <laughs> uh, American steam locomotives or non-American steam locomotives that way. So uh, if we find a way to submit uh, and do that, uh, you know, I think that would be a, a lot of fun. So be I... more than happy to do that. I will put this out there right now. If you people have cursed locomotives, feel free to DM me directly. Give me what the locomotive is. Give me a picture of it. Give me why it's weird. And then I'll assemble some sort of a tier list thing. I've done it before. I'll do it again. And Gauntlet has been good. thrown, ladies and gents. Yeah, there you go. In before Spinotto. <laughs> In before Spinotto, yes. 
<laughs> Did you know that the Mount Tam had this fucked up thing? Ah! Yeah, basically. <laughs> Jordan Freeman, con control your smoke. Oh god, that's how far back we are. Okay. Yep. I really gotta I really gotta catch up here. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. Shiba Inu gifting twenty memberships. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we we I really gotta we, we I'm so far back. We we really gotta catch up here. Angry Rail fan. Brickman, seven months. Speaking of the CNS, explain the Alpine Tunnel. Oh man, Alpine Tunnel is uh is a vibe. Um, don't like. Was the tunnel through to the Fair Play region, right? That was to get to Gunnison. That was to get. It was to get to Gunnison. Okay. Um, stupid, stupid high elevation, and so it always had. Uh, I don't know, old man winter problems. Which is why it didn't last, and then they ended up closing it. But that's uh, about the, all I got. The, the loading gauge for it was also so tiny that on multiple occasions, like there are reports of large locomotives waddling slightly and like striking the sides of the tunnel. <laughs> well, you also had to walk the rotary through it like a dog. Oh Quite God. literally, they had to have a guy out front with a cord that ran to the whistle, and he would just be watching as the rotary slowly moved through and got to that curve on the that's the eastern side um, <laughs> and just making sure it doesn't hit any of the timbers and it if it gets a... really close pull the cord <laughs> it was also unventilated and a lot of crews got choked out in it yep yeah alpine tunnel is a clusterfuck that's for sure MK Brakeman for two months will be there more Zuma design streams. Yes, as soon as SolidWorks fucking figures its goddamn shit out. Man, it has been broken. I have not been able to launch SolidWorks for about six weeks now. Um, and I pay for a license for it, which is really annoying. And they have the guile, they have the balls to send me a hey, we'd love your feedback survey on SolidWorks to my email, and I ripped them a new butthole in that survey. So uh, maybe they'll push a patch that fixes it, but I have reinstalled it and still does not work. So uh, as soon as I can get that to work, I will do that. And if it does not look like it's going to work, I might uh, we might just have to restart in a different CAD program, which will then have me learning a new CAD program. And that will just be uh, a thing. But uh, I kind of want to try that uh, that online CAD software uh, that Stuff Made Here referenced um, at the end of one of his videos because you can everything saves to the cloud and you could have multiple contributors so like Brett and I could be doing the design together and speed it up a little bit and and do coordinated streams like that which might be really fun because Brett actually has some of the tender drawn in SolidWorks already spoilers uh, so yeah that uh, that would be fun and Brett's actually designed locomotives completely in SolidWorks, so he's uh, more uh, more qualified than I anyways. So, <laughs> But yes, we'll get there. Peregrina, have a few bucks, all I got this month, and explain the 20 soup cans since I've never heard the origin of that meme. Thanks. Well, thank you, and no worries about uh, uh, top chat things. I appreciate whatever you can do, and nobody's required to, to donate and everything. Um the soup cans. So the soup cans, the more I've heard about it, they may that might have actually been a myth. Um, perpetuated by the railroad. It may not actually have been what they had, but the story was that they didn't have rod brasses to hold the grease in 20 um, and because they didn't have brass. And so they used soup cans that they poked holes in inside the rod to act as the rod brass so they could still charge it full of grease and the grease would get held in by something. But I mean, they're using a soup can as a as part of a floating bearing, and and it's just like really. So, uh, it it sounds like that got debunked during the restoration. Jeff, when I brought it up to Jeff, Jeff was like, "No, they didn't do that." So, eh. But that's the origin of the thing. Was oh my god, they had no money, so they used soup cans for bearings, which not true bearing, uh, a floating bushing and and uh like bronze, but brass for the rods is actually just. It floats it like it bears the weight when it gets one side or the other of the slop, but it's supposed to bear it through the grease and everything. So if it's a well greased bearing, technically it you wouldn't need the thing, but you got to hold the grease in somehow. So anyway, Craig Bryant, do you believe there will be any brand new steam engines that will be built in the United States? If so, what kind? Well, the T1 for one, I believe they will. Duck for dinner. They, will they will finish that thing out somehow and duck for dinner. Yes. Um, 
and then uh, hopefully the uh, a little little Rio Grande uh, class twenty five made by some idiot in Colorado maybe. Um, and actually, speaking of things that are actually being made, the the RGS thirty six I saw pictures of it quite recently. Um, it's almost done, which is really exciting. So there's going to be a new build four four zero for the Ridgeway Museum. So it's slightly scary. Uh, it's not slightly oh, also, scary. Also, the first actually, new locomotive for the Rio Grande Southern. That is yeah. scary. Yes, that that, <laughs> that in is principle for breaking history. <clears throat> when um, is that thing going to be done? How far along is uh, it? It, they're Someday. estimating sometime next year, I think is what it is. And I saw pictures. Um, I know the superintendent at Ridgeway now. Uh, he reached out to me and, he, and uh, ended up coming to help us with some of his 20s annual so he could learn steam a little better. Um, and he's a really nice guy named Forrest. And he showed pictures of what it looked like that, you know, very recently when I saw him about a month ago. Um, and it looks like a locomotive. Like... It, it it is almost there. They are very close, so uh, I'm excited for that. But rest assured, uh, I will be there when it uh, when it does the thing. So, speaking of locomotives, <laughs> you want to take the mic out of your butthole? Since it's the RGS, is it alcohol fire? Oh well, I mean, you know, it's fine. I think it's actually still gonna burn coal. I think. Not 100% uh, certain. Last I heard was probably oil fired. Well, which makes sense for a small op like that. Right. We'll have to see. I know that the big thing was that they wanted to do was run it with a, a diesel compressor in the tender so that if like a, a school trip showed up and wanted to see the engine move, they could at least move it around under its own power with compressed air, which is a little hokey, but I get it. Like for that op where it, they're in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, like one off like you can't have the engine fired up like when a, just a trip shows up and arrives in Ridgeway Ridgeway is not a big town so I can understand that need so another new build that's really close is the VNT Lion oh that's right that's a new oh, build oh they made it? progress yeah. on that too nice it, it's 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 getting closer they're working on the cab right now but it's a photo from I think the Great Western Steam Up um Oh yeah, that's that's pretty yeah. much what it looked like when I saw it. Great Western Steam Up. So, it's it's slowly getting there. The story behind that one's funny because it's just like a dude in Iowa was like, just woke up one day like I want to build a replica of the VNT Lion and just showed up on the museum's doorstep with it's like, hey, I made a thing. Do you want it? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, super neat. <laughs> and the 3D printed uh, crosshead pump, super cool. Yeah, it's just a, a demonstrational piece and checking right. the fitting, but you know, right? Because you're you're not going to be able to plumb high pressure water through that. So, but super cool. Uh, let's let's just three D print a steam locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> they can't stop us. <laughs> Fine. Oh goodness, let me see. Scrolling back up, Elmo person. There's a there's a cured. I'm just assuming you mean a cursed locomotive in train crew train crew chat do you want me to look at it now or do you want to save it for the whole cursed event i can take a look at it you donated thank you uh which one it's one of these two i cannot i cannot pronounce this whatever this hyperlink is oh and those are those are those turbine engines yeah yeah i'm i'm I am too uneducated American for this. <laughs> uh, what? 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 It's the mechanism. What? Break what? all your bones. What? 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 Look what? at this. It's, what? It's the. It's the mechanism. What? What? In what? Nice dot exe. What? Stop working. Would you like to search online for a solution? To the what? Problem? What? Break all your bones. What? What? I'm guessing what? this is French. What? <laughs> what? Oh, I don't think that's French. What? What? <laughs> what? Just, uh, uh, look, safety valves. I recognize those. What the fuck is the rest of this? <laughs> so I just got to I just got to tip off uh back to the lion photo for a second. Okay. Someone we know is in that photo. I won't say who. Oh boy. Someone we, someone we know. 
uh, someone who is currently hanging out in my server, actually. <laughs> uh, all the way back and to the left in a black shirt. <laughs> to the left, to the left. Oh, oh. No, I can't tell who that is, but... I... That might not be him. Uh, I, I, I got a tip that that was Spinoto. But... Oh, was he at Great Western Steam Up? He was. He missed you by supposedly about a half hour. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> that's... <laughs> well, well, maybe not. Maybe he would have gotten COVID via Leighton, too. So, you know. Anyway. Oh, no, that is him. Black hat. Sorry. Ah, a Spinoto. There he is. Okay. The Shibu Inu, good God, man. Thank you. You're going to call it here. You all have a wonderful day. I love y'all. You're all amazing people. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for the huge top chat. I don't know what to say. Steven, oh goodness, uh, with the last name that I cannot pronounce again. Steven Sachs, perhaps? What do I think of the idea for a new format series? You show your American viewers some European railways. For example, in Germany, we have some interesting locos from Betsy size up to two ten twos in standard or narrow gauge. That would be fun. I mean, the, the problem with that is that, like, I am not an expert or I'm not even, like, vaguely knowledgeable about a lot of European railways. So if I have somebody to help guide me through it that wants to share via the channel, like, hey, let's talk about this cool thing, I'd be more than happy to. But um, I, I don't have the experience to, like, just be able to drive that series myself. So. Okay. Scrolling down. Striker, welcome to the ES and D engineers. Thank you. Make sure you uh <laughs> make sure you you uh join the Discord and or take a look at the community posts for engineers. I need to, need some info from you. Craig Bryant, Coombrace and Toltec train ride is sixty four miles, three foot gauge. Is there any more historical three foot gauge rail tracks still in use with that kind of mileage? If so, where the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge? It's only forty five miles one way. But historical, 45 miles one way. So 90 mile round trip, the, your actual trip on the DNS is longer, but you go both directions over the railroad in one day. Um, and that's historic, three foot gauge. Uh, and then the White Pass in Yukon is also historic. I don't know exactly how many miles they have. I mean, originally they had, I think, even more than that, but they're they're still around and they run at least part of the alignment. So they Yeah, they have technically rails all the way up to Whitehorse. They just only, the furthest they operate right now is Carcross, which is about two-thirds of the way up the route. So, yeah, significant. But for three foot, I mean, those are going to be the, the three big ones, I think. And East Broadtop, but East Broadtop, I think, is uh, 30-some miles. So, 35. 35. Yeah, those 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 four would be the big historic still around uh, three foot gauge things. <clears throat> Let's see. Spagel Smagel or sorry, Spagel Smeagel. Yes, I heard you pronounce your username in person. Finally, upgrading to an ESND engineer. Why? Thank you, man. I didn't have to do that. Although I can just consider it gas money for driving you to the train station after the museum. I guess. <laughs> ML person again. The cursed locomotive was an experimental steam turbine locomotive with a condenser built for the Swedish State Railway. Well, that explains why it does not look like a locomotive in any other sense. Squiddy 2004 upgraded to an ESD engineer. Why, thank you. Okay, um, I want to get back to our questions from the uh, the the post because we have ten pages worth of questions and we're on the second page, so. <laughs> gonna see what i can get and uh and then we'll, we'll also do some live questions here I, th I finally caught the bottom of the top chats i think here so uh burn burn touton brick buicks burn tooten buicks 7160 i'm not sure how to pronounce that uh, have i ever done or do i have plans to work with private rail cars or private varnish i never have um i won't i wouldn't say never i'd love to to wrench on him or help but um i don't know anyone who has anything other than caboose with his caboose and i would gladly go help with this caboose but that's not exactly private varnish in service that is a clapped out rio grande caboose standard gauge caboose that uh is being unclapped out by our very own caboose himself he's doing a great job so um and it's gonna be parked at his uh house so it's not like it's gonna go run on the main or anything but still very cool 
Ben Gray 2787, are any of the standard gauge diesels able to be restored to operation status at the museum, I presume he means. Uh, the 5401, yeah, that'd be really easy to get uh, back running. That's the tunnel motor. The rest of them, uh, no. The F7s have sat with, or F9s have sat with their, uh, all of the, like, <laughs> everything exposed, and I'm sure everything's got water in it and rusted, and, and the engine doesn't bar over. Um, and so those don't do the thing. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and then the 3011 is missing bits from Omnitrax, stealing bits from it before they donated it. And then, um, Oh, burnt out. Oh, oh, that that makes more sense. You're in the chat. Burnt out Buicks. <laughs> burnt out on Buicks. Hey, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> when I read it all together and it's all lowercase, it was just like, ah, uh, uh, I don't know how to do this. But good. Um Yeah, uh, and then the the core switcher uh has no engine in it. So yeah. Cause Coors wrecked it and then stole the prime mover and donated the shell. Anyway. <clears throat> Twisted GS, what's my weirdest slash funniest any train related dream? I have a recurring nightmare that I get several times uh, a year of running out of coal in the firebox while like going up Coombrace or something uh, or in the tender. And I go back and look and there's just like pipes and bullshit in the tender. Like it's like it looks like one of the K37s in Aunt Nito where it's just like random spare parts are in the tender. <laughs> And so it's like, I'll just throw it in anyway. I have that recurring dream. That's uh, that's about it. UP3982 Trainmaster Challenger. What is your favorite steam locomotive and explain why? I don't have one and I've explained why on every single one of these. Every single time. All, all, always. I, I like, I don't have a favorite. It's the big boy. It's the big boy, everybody. Don't when listen was, to him. It's the big boy. When I was a kid, uh, the big boy was absolutely my favorite. Um, I loved <laughs> the big boy. Uh, and I love the 4449. Um, I loved those two engines when I was a kid for sure. Um, but even then, I don't know if I had a favorite between them two. Like after I saw 4449, before I saw 4449, I thought the big boy was the coolest. Then I saw 4449 in person. Then I kind of fell in love with that. And I love both of those engines. Didn't really have a favorite between them. Um, and then I got in the narrow gauge kick and, and now I just love all the narrow gauge crap. And I, I still love those engines. You know, the no big boy meme comes from people requesting it to be added to railroads online, which I mean, if you can't figure out why that's stupid, uh, <laughs> God help you. Um, but yeah, no, I like, I honestly genuinely do not have a favorite. So Chris Gill, we're going to need you to go cover the steam train races they do down in Australia for their Hunter Valley steam fest. Well, hell yeah. I just got to make it to Australia, which I, I like bucket list for me, but that's uh, not cheap or uh, simple or <laughs> easy. So we'll figure it out. Uh, Polar Vortex, welcome to the conductors as well. <clears throat> Eshock 9208. Log roads, log rails, anyone? Thoughts on railroads that use logs for their railroads? Log Logging, logging, not even once. Like logging ops, like just, just like, no. Just, I can only imagine the level of jank that went into that, but that's just logging. Have I ever ridden an Amtrak train? If so, what was it like? Yes, I rode uh, the Empire Builder from Seattle to Chicago with my dad when I was 10. Uh, just, just as a fun thing. It was like, hey, for your birthday, let's just go ride this train to Chicago. It's like, have a bonding moment, get to ride a train, and super fun. Um, it was a surprise and one of my favorite memories with my dad. Um, yeah, it was great. The, we had a little roomette. We played cards. The scenery is gorgeous for the first third of that ride. And then it's the flyover states, but you're on a train. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, definitely fun. And I, I always remember we had um, one of the guys that worked the dining car. I don't know if he was, I don't, I don't know if he was, waiter was his just to his title or if he was a car attendant or whatever. Guy named, I remember it, it. His name was like Antonio or Anthony. I can't remember, but he, he was the, sweetest most fun character of a dude was just happy to talk to everybody and was just owning the job and was just like the nicest guy out there and like had knew all the spots and all the stops like oh you should go like get a get a treat from this place or whatever we have 15 minutes like go do this and whatever and he was just like just like the coolest guy you'd ever want to have like guiding your journey on the railroad and uh my, my dad i remember he ended up writing and tracking like this guy was freaking awesome 
So hopefully something good came to him. I wish I remembered his, his actual name. It's been many years now, but uh, that was awesome. So Amtrak's cool. And uh, am I looking forward to new train transit like California High Speed Rail, Brightline, etc.? I mean, if they ever come to fruition, stares at California High Speed Rail. Uh, but yes, more more high speed choo choos in the U.S. is a very good thing. So definitely. Jonathan Coleman, more trains. Are there any more trips that you will be in Pennsylvania for, like the EBT? Next time you come to Pennsylvania, see if Brett and Layton can come see Pennsylvania too. The next big event will be October seventh for the Fall Spectacular at the EBT. I. Next time I go to Pennsylvania, I will tell you right here, right now, I will be coming to see the 2102 beat the shit out of itself. <laughs> and I will be there. <laughs> That's, that is what I, I desire to go to Pennsylvania for. I want to hear a Redding six chime blow out my eardrums in person, like desperately. Yeah, I want to hear that thing. And I want to I want to be able to film that thing. That would be most excellent. Um, but uh, yeah, I Run don't the know. Thing. It's better I, I, in person. I, I'm, I never, you never ask, like, I'm not going to be like, Hey, can I do this? But, uh, if somebody, if, if I got offered the, the, the right seat, man, I mean, I wouldn't say no, but, uh, I somehow expect that would not be the case, but, uh, yeah, I'd love to come see that thing in person and get to experience it. Cause, oh, and I would love to get back to the EBT, uh, probably in a little while though, once they've gotten a little bit more done. I mean, I saw where they're at now. I want to see their next step. Uh, you know, what that they're doing is really cool, but I, I don't think I'd take a, another explicit trip out just for EBT. Um, I would definitely be going to try and like see the 2102, see some other stuff in PA. So I'll definitely get out there. Um, Leighton and Brett, uh, man, trying to coordinate all three of us these days is hurting cats because they have lady friends and, and lady friend things and stuff and words and, and things. And Leighton goes on trips all the time. And eh, it's hard to coordinate all three of us, even for meeting up, uh, around these parts these days sometimes. So, uh, coordinating, I'd love to go with, uh, with them, but I imagine that'd be hard to coordinate, but perhaps so anyway. Uh, Admiral Mustachio. Hey, hi, it's been enjoying the content. Was wondering though, have I heard about the restoration of the NC and STL 576? It was Nashville Centennial Park since retirement 52. Hope to have it steaming soon. Look up a picture. And what are my thoughts on CSX heritage units? Yes, I've heard of the 576. Uh, fun fact, I've heard of probably most, if not all of the active restorations in the industry. So 576, I'm pretty uh, keyed up with, um, and somebody just asked that question in chat at the same time. Yes, I have heard about the 576. It's it's a cool engine. Uh, it's exciting. Nashville Steam is going to be neat. Um, and I'm sure that, that that'll be a good market to try and draw some folks into as well. Uh, so that'll be cool. And CSX Heritage Units. I don't really care about Heritage Units at all because, like, I'm, I'm a Steam guy. Um, and see, it like, the fact that they're doing them is neat. Uh, people have opinions on the paint and whatever. And it's like, okay, like... Yeah, I mean, I I could I can get from the company standpoint why they're still putting their logo and like part of their paint scheme on it because you have to have brand recognition as a railroad like BNSF. God help you if you touch the swoosh, man. Um, jeez, the branding was so important. There was a repainted Santa Fe heritage unit done up at the Argentine shop in Kansas City that one of the superintendents who loved Santa Fe was an old Santa Fe guy had the, the paint shop do and they painted it up and it was beautiful perfect to match I don't remember if it was which scheme it was but they repainted it brand new Santa Fe lettered Santa Fe everything just had the BNSF reporting mark and it was ready to roll and corporate got wind and said when that locomotive leaves this shop, it will be orange and it will have the swoosh BNSF on the side. And so they had to repaint it again. So <laughs> I can understand the, the corporate nature of we need to have our, our logo on it and whatever. So I can get that. It's neat that they're doing heritage units. Would it be cool if they were like explicitly like, boom, this is just the old scheme? Yeah, that would be way cooler. But yeah, that, that information hurts. Right? That doesn't that, doesn't that just ruin hurt. your day? It just ruined everything for me, man. Hates right? freedom. Yep. Welcome, uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, the welcome to corporate, uh, corporate, corporateness. Why do you think working for the railroads not too fun anymore? Uh, because it's just a giant corporation, and giant corporations are not necessarily the most fun thing to deal with in the world. So, uh, I will tell you, but though, uh, going back to five seventy six, because I did a deep dive the other day. 
I would I I would reckon to bet that they are probably one of the most well organized independent uh, locomotive operators really out there. Is the, they are their plan is just second to none. Well, that's kick they, ass. That's they awesome, can man. run directly out of downtown Nashville. It is right <sighs> next to the Country Music Hall of Fame, dude. I'm, it's right there. That's that's butts and seats. Like that's that is that is how you pay for your choo choo. Like that. Yeah. And Nashville, Nashville being such the party town and being like recognized kind of as like oh it's it's like the Las Vegas of the East kind of thing. And people go there uh, as a destination for whatever. And it has kind of that sort of charm, like the Southern charm, Southern vibe thing going on. Like oh, steam train fits in with this whole sort of flavor. Oh, and okay, you know, the music scene and people like Johnny Cash and they love trains and that. You insert steam train to Nashville like you just print dollars. So if they're really well organized, that's great to hear. So yeah, you give Dollywood a run for their money. Seriously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's like, and, and I mean, you have uh, like Marty Stewart writing a song about the locomotive and stuff. They love that engine down there. That's Which awesome. is even better. So the city loves them. And they have, I think a hundred odd miles of track to play with and it's almost all like mainline-esque track that's awesome let's see uh, let me catch a couple top chats here and then we'll get back to questions jordan freeman uh oh, we haven't had music going in a minute i was like what why does it feel weird ah because the music stopped let's turn the music back on Jordan Freeman, did you read my email about that bunker under the Greenbrier Resort that you should check out if you go to Cass? Um, I'm not familiar. I might have missed that one. I'll have to double check and dig for it. Um, if you guys don't know, I monitor like 10 fucking email accounts these days. <laughs> so if you email me something and I don't get back to you or I miss it, like just have patience. Um, because I'm involved, like I have two emails for the YouTube channel. I have several personal ones uh for like the band stuff for me um and then like the older one that like sometimes shit gets sent to from uh, older accounts and whatever um and and then my museum email and it it just keeps going uh so yeah i'm only one person (laughs) so i'll have to uh dig for that one jordan i i think i missed that one so thank you for letting me know modius have some more money everyone loves money that's true thank you have you seen the cursed K37 that's popped up in my Discord? Oh, don't do this to me. No, maybe? I don't know. Which which cursed K37 is it? I don't know if I want to see it. I don't need to be hurt emotionally today. <laughs> I mean, if somebody has the picture, I mean, let me know and I'll look at it. But anyway. Polar Vortex, conductor for one month. Hey, heist now a conductor because it's cold and outside and warm inside. Eager to continue sharing things you've learned from my train guy on YouTube. Well, that's awesome, man. Thank you for joining the conductors, and uh, I'm glad that uh, that's uh, doing the thing for you. So, don't look, you don't look at it. You don't want to see it. It's so dumb. Where is it? No, I see it. It's an ESD train crew. I hate whoever did this. Oh, Bernie, that, that's worse than the one I did with oh. the, the whale back and the center mounted headlight. You didn't even put the buffers in line with the goddamn frame members, man. Wait, hold on, Wings. Can you send me the whale back one? I want to see it. Oh, no. Or that might have been a K36. Hold on. Anyway. Oh, no, the, the K-37 was the one on the moon. Now that's now the I've been emotionally scarred. <laughs> <laughs> that's not incredible. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> WMRR Fireball. Highest with your with the current prolifer- pr- pr- proliferation of tourist lines in the U.S., do you think the market is or soon will be saturated and result in failures of the lines that do not have a unique draw? Ah, oh, that's a great question, and it's an interesting question uh, because here in Colorado, we have like 
uh, we we uh, Colorado and Pennsylvania are the two places most saturated with tourist railroads, um, and they still. Both of us are like, the, all the railroads still survive. They still continue on as unique as they are. And it's because they all pull from a different population to some extent. And I think that's the big secret. You need to find a way to pull from a general population. Like, okay, Durango is Durango and it's America's railroad and people go there as a destination. Um, but like railroads like the Georgetown Loop, they're close to Denver us the colorado railroad museum we're close to denver we're pulling people from the denver area there's a lot of people in denver there's only going to continue to be more people in denver as long as you know trends continue and all these things um so like i don't know uh, if i see anything going bust or failing failing or anything um like it, it's hard to say but you know if a railroad's not doing the right thing they're not marketing they're not getting their audience out to them then they might fail. I mean, it's not an easy industry to have a lot of success in, but if you do the right things and get the right group of people and pulled in and you have a source of people for you, you're not in the middle of nowhere, you can have that success. So it's, uh, I don't know if we're going to have a saturation problem. I think the, the thing that would cause a tourist railroad to go bust is, is a, a mismanagement or a management problem more so, I think. So... Damn it, Wings. <laughs> it is close to perfection. But the, okay, but see, like, this doesn't hurt me inside. This is this is actually just kind of fun. And this is so well done that it's painful. <laughs> the center don't, headlight. Don't worry what we're going to do high the mounted, <laughs> The high-mounted bell. <laughs> the whale back tender. Like, this just looks like a picture. This Photoshop is so well done. Well, I got—I got I don't know if the stream has seen the. Uh, did you hear they faked the Farmington branch? Oh yes, Nobody I did knows. hear they faked the Farmington branch. But yes, please, please, rem please remind me of the, how they faked the Farmington branch. Yeah. Well, they filmed the Farmington branch on the soundstage. They did, yeah. <laughs> Send the picture. <laughs> oh, let me find it. There it is. <laughs> Hold on. I'm excited uh, for everyone to see this. This one. This is the best thing. Everybody's favorite brand. They, they faked Junico. it. They faked. They faked. The, the, it was filmed on a down sound stage. It wasn't real. <laughs> Checkmate conspiracy theorists. <laughs> It's so stupid. That's oh, beautiful. Raritan on the moon, boys. Just, I, I had so much fun making the Linoco tank car. The Linoco tank. It's so good. So it's good. It's the perfect brand. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Let me catch a couple of top chats here. Modius, I'm sorry, Heiss, it was you. Well, I appreciate the apology. It's a well, it's a well done shit post, but it does hurt me inside. And then somebody, uh, the YouTube broke, and somebody was a brakeman for a month, and it doesn't say who. So, uh, thank you. Chat says John Madden. John, John football. <laughs> Mark, 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 Mark. No, yes. we need to explore. <laughs> Wait, no, we need to explore. <laughs> exclamation point question mark exclamation point qu damn you all to hell we, we gotta stop or we'll never continue <laughs> <laughs> yes josh m uh we answered your question earlier josh uh uh about the jnr stuff you'll have to catch it on the vod for the full explanation um because or, or tyler I, actually I had a diagram oh do you have a diagram, have a diagram okay now. well it's brought up now if you got a diagram now we can do it again um, okay well but... a diagram of the internal portion oh okay so the so the the stack thingy on those Japanese engines um, is kind of like a blower. All of the spark arresting is on the inside, and that's that's wacky looking. Um, that's not that's not a cyclone, but it's not a master mechanics front end either. That's weird. Yeah, it's that's super it's a weird. weird mix. It's something. That's cool though. So all the spark arresting happens down there, and the fan is is like their equivalent of a blower. I'd never actually seen a blower fan but that's not a spark arresting device at all um yeah it's super weird 
it's also weird because the blower actually it plums into the lower that lower cylindrical portion okay it doesn't like it's not you know straight down or up at the top it's just kind of comes in where you've got you can kind of tell where there's a rectangular box right weird yep super weird yeah that's a that's a neat thing i'd never seen that before but thanks to tyler for being here and having the, the little details we talked about it a little bit more and showed the cage and everything um earlier so you have to check the vod on the rest of it but yeah that's a it's a wacky thing Let's design. see. <clears throat> Polar Vortex. Favorite wacky loco design. I don't know if I have a favorite. I, I tend to not like them. Um, the Fairleys are super weird. The the Fairleys, like, they win the wackiness contest for me, I think. Like, a Garrett is is reasonable. Like, but but the the Fairley, the Fairley's weird. But it still works, so. Mason Bogey. Emil Person, have you ever seen a 220T locomotive? No, but speaking of wacky freaking dreams, I had a dream about uh, derailing on a, some cursed railroad last night, and we had to be rescued by an O22T and wondering what the fuck it was. It was like a cube on wheels. I forgot about that until this moment. Uh, the 22, is that, did, I've seen like 222s. And I've seen like four two O's and four two. There, there is a two two O. There is the a two two O. Hold on, it was one of the first engines in California. That's right. I want to say the SP flea? or CP or someone. The like that. the San Pedro, I think. Oh God. Sam Osborne, member for two months with the ESD engineers. Thanks for making it two months, Sam. Solaris, the long hauler, rail fan. Hey, Heist, have you heard about the story of the Flying Scotsman when it came to the United States? I have. Leighton keeps bringing it up as trivia uh, in three quarters of an idiot stuff. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I want to get through at least a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to have to go pick up my car. My Subaru is finally repaired. I'm going to have to go uh, pick that up shortly here. So. Train crew chat for the 220T in the Discord. Oh, weird. This is not the one that Wings is pulling up, so we'll share it. I pulled up. I think this is the one that Wings is looking for. Yeah, I'm having <laughs> just, trouble finding just, it. Just, yep, that's the one. Just two axles with the wackiest fucking looking stack I've ever seen. And outside Stevenson. And outside Stevenson. <laughs> freaking that? weird. Might not be outside Steve. It kind of looks like it is. I, it might be the straight link there is making me think it's one of the kind of variations oh right not true stevenson that's right and then yeah. and then here's the uh here here's the american flavor <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just, 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 you, you, you're missing hill. some Overdale. you're missing some bits friend where's the rest of I, it I, I think it's cute it's, it's fun like it needs a headlight but <laughs> headlight we, we we took an american and we shrunk it what what, are the, what is it doing yeah So, Katano, can you explain the double fairlies, please? Okay, so the thing about the double fairly, basically, is that for most of them... Oh, hang on. Emil Person. It's Alan Valve Gear. Okay, so it's one of... Yeah, yeah. Alan specifically as the mod of Stevenson. Uh, double fairlies. The, the are two locomotive... Two engines in one locomotive. And typically, I think the Welsh ones at least, the boiler runs all the way through. It's one boiler. But two throttles, two Johnson bars, two fire doors. The fire boxes are separate, so you could run one side without running the other. And the fireman fires from the side. Yes, yeah, give me the diagram. We've pulled this diagram up so many times on the channel. Keeps coming up. The, the original uh, Rank the Railroads Online tech tree uh, was what made me learn of the, the cursedness of this. But yeah, the fireman fires both, si both fire boxes from one side. And then the engineer's on the other side. Um, and runs the two engines separately, and they're on a, a pivoted bogey frame, and it's just they're just so bizarre, but very neat at the same time. Oh man, I came back to Fairleys. You did. Yep. Yeah, we're back to this point. <laughs> 
Josh M, thank you so much. You'll go back and look for it. Be, by the way, I love your 101 series. There was a video where you said you love hearing SLs work. Many of the preserved SLs in Japan, they work them where they run. Well, that's, I'm going to have to go see it. You're the gymnast 98. That 220 should be called a 13 colonies. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to get through. Goodness, this guy asked five questions. That's a, that's a whole lot. Let's see. Geneva Rail Fan 3909. Question one, what features, objects, equipment would always be found in and around a roundhouse? You're modeling one that served steamed and diesel in the 50s. Uh, all sorts of random little things that you wouldn't think about, like uh, random like shop accoutrement, like barrels, oil, tubs, drums, uh, ladders, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Like that's going to be found in any roundhouse, um, any shop. Um, you go with wrenches? In, if, yeah, big wrenches. In the 50s, you're going to have big wrenches for steam. You're going to have other wrenches for diesel. You'll have machine tools still. You'll have a back shop with lathes and mills and vertical turret lathes and slaughters and shapers and all sorts of stuff like that still. If it's a bigger roundhouse. Um, but big crescent wrenches, big pipe wrenches, uh, monkey wrenches, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, probably organized in some flavor with material in one place and, and uh, tools in another place. So... Uh, that would probably get you started at the very least. Related to that, what did the standard required servicing schedules look like back in the day for both steam and diesel? You're trying to create a realistic one for a model railroad set in the 50s, and you're not sure which requirements are modern. Uh, the, the funny thing about the modern requirements is that they're kind of based on what the locomotives need, right? Except for the, the absolutely most modern stuff, uh, which is a little different. But like for a steam engine, they still had a monthly or 31 day service inspection. Do the boiler wash like that came around because the engine gets pissed if you don't clean out the boiler after 30 days. Like that's why we have that. Um, so steam, you would have had a big annual annual inspection and you would have had the 31 day inspections primarily. And then quarterly of the 92s, you would have a little bit more done. Um, and then diesel really only had a 92 day to start and that was some filters and some things and then a bigger annual and, and semi-annual so um like that tradition came from what the engines needed and so that was pretty much what railroads that did good maintenance did jack morgan train crew chat for a cursed 2620 locomotive i know exactly i know the exact locomotive i know this picture before i even look at it i know what this is yeah yeah, this, this this stupid thing. The stupid thing that looks like an artist drew it, but it's actually a locomotive. Yeah. we This does not spark joy. We do not like this. <clears throat> Thank you, though, Jack. Let's see. Geneva Rail fan still. What type of valve gear do Shays and Heislers use? Looks like most use Stevenson, but you're not sure. I'm pretty sure they all use Stevenson. Um, there might be some that used wall shirts, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised, but... Bar, uh, bar none for the most part they're uh, Stevenson in the Argus Blizzard episode someone referred to the narrow gauge circle what is that you're not seeing a complete loop anywhere on the map since the Grand and the Argus didn't connect north of Silverton yes they did the narrow gauge circle let me pull up little engines big men because I'm pretty sure they got a map of it right here in the, inside the cover here it is the narrow gauge circle <laughs> the whole thing uh, you, we'd have to zoom in and really look at it, but uh, they connected at Ridgeway, I wanted to say. Was it Ridgeway or Montrose? Where the... No, Ridgeway was definitely Grand and RGS because the Grand ran to Uray. Yeah, so they did connect north of Silverton at Ridgeway. Yeah, it used to be all narrow gauge. It, I mean, it doesn't exist now and it hasn't for a long time. Let me see. Narrow gauge circle. Yeah, uh, contrary to what popular uh, train games that would tell you that there's only 200 miles of narrow gauge would say, uh, there, there used to be 1,300 miles of narrow gauge living at the same time. So this was all actually narrow gauge at one point, although very quickly the Denver to Pueblo, Denver to Salida, Denver to Alamosa lines all got standard gauged, uh, and then including Alamosa to Creed. But you had the DNRG over to Montrose, down to Ridgeway, down to Uray, although Silverton and Uray were not connected. That, uh, that, uh, <laughs> not since the Silverton railroads went bust, at least. But, um, uh, Ridgeway, and then down to Durango, that way it was the RGS, and then the rest of that was the Rio Grande, so. 
Yep. Fun fact. Silverton being connected to Uray is very wrong. Okay, I might be remembering my Silverton railroads wrong, which wouldn't be surprised. So, yeah, Silverton to Uray, they tried to connect it, but the never only worked out. Survey they could do was like an eight percent electric rack railway, which didn't get built because of the silver okay. panic. The so RGS then that never happened. Yeah, the RGS exists because that's the long way around from Silverton to Uray. I see. That makes sense. Let's see. And last question from Geneva Railfan. How possible would it be in theory to equip a steam locomotive with full PTC? What sort of electronic mechanical interface device would be needed? If something like this could be designed, it'd be wonderful for preservation. Um, there is no, there is no need or desire for, to actually do that. Like the leap PTC with having a diesel behind you that takes care of it. Like that is everything we need. Uh, like, trying to do this and shoehorn PTC in a steam engine, you could do it. And you could get power that would be clean enough with modern power requirements and stuff. You could make it work. But you're trying to stuff a lot of sensitive computer equipment in a place where there's not really space. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you would need to have dedicated power at 74 volts. Um, <clears throat> like, running an extra dynamo or something. Um, or an axle gen or so like you need to have clean power and then you could do it, but there's no reason to do it and try and slap all this equipment in a dirty, gross steam engine cab. Um, when you could just have it in the diesel behind you and not have to modify the shit out of the steam engine. You could, you totally cool. you like totally could, but it's, it's really not honestly worth it. So. Well, 2926 has a full separate array. No, it does, does it not. not? It has really? Leap PTC. That was the engine that it got developed on, and that's where UP got the idea. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> Subpar Robot Wars asks, my thought on BattleBots World Champs 7. Oh, man, they know. They know I'm a BattleBots farmer. Uh, I thought it was great. I thought the final um, the final matches in the, the tournament were freaking amazing. Uh, some of the best fights I've ever seen in BattleBots. Um, at least at least one BattleBots team based in Colorado. Any possibility to contact them and do a video? That'd be fun. It's not really my purview. I would have fun with it, but eh. And then when will three quarters idiot slash CRM make a BattleBot? Um, when they allow us to make something that weighs a million thousand pounds and riveted steel, uh, that's our expertise. <laughs> I don't uh, I don't think you'll see us making a BattleBot anytime soon. It'd be fun, but uh, but uh, we've got train stuff to do. Main line through the Rockies. The man, the myth, the legend. If the museum had hypothetically somehow rebuilt the entire Clear Creek line, it's a big hypothetically, including the loop, and operated the line regularly like the DNS, would you enjoy the longer operations, being able to take the engines out on a proper, fast, long run over the difficult grades, or do you enjoy the smaller scale ops on the, at the current museum? I mean, there's, there's ups and downs to it, right? Like, uh, the nice thing about the small scale ops is that we have small scale maintenance and we have a small tight knit crew. Um, if we were running a big op like that, like you'd be beating the crap out of the engines and you'd have to maintain the engines, need a bigger shop, need more people, FRA considerations, all sorts of stuff that adds a lot to make the operation work. Um, would it be cool and worth it? Yeah. Run up Clear Creek in a K37? I mean, that would feel wrong, but it would feel right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> eh. Uh, I mean, not going to happen because, you know, there's a whole highway that blocks most of that right away, but uh, that would be very fun. So, yeah, I've been jonesing to run somewhere else for a while. So, anyway. ML. In Sweden, we have a steam locomotive with Swedish ATC that is the Swedish equivalent to PTC. I'm not surprised. Um, and PTC in the U.S. is kind of really dissimilar to a lot of the European systems. Um but you like you could absolutely do it is the thing but yeah anyway scarlet moon 3714 hey i just wanted to ask you about the mason bogey history and engines like it would you possibly make a video on the subject one day gladly i don't know much about them and their history um but you know uh talk to some of these people like uh, some of the fine folks in this call and uh, we could easily make that happen all right, and if there was ever a question to end on here uh, before I have to go pick up my car, from Zoe McElroy, 0811, 
I know you're in preservation, but what is one currently active locomotive that you would kill if given the chance? Do I just say 611 to watch the world burn? Oh. <laughs> only joking, only joking. 611's a sweetheart. Good engine. Um, that's that's where my uh, my masochistic head went though right away though. Um, one engine, just one, because you can't kill a whole class then unless it's like the last one. Because when I worked for BNSF, I wanted those SDW 1500s to die, man. God, those were crap. It's so funny okay, your so attitude when you work for the railroad versus when you work in preservation. Like so funny how different your attitude is. Um, singular engine to kill. Oh man, <clears throat> six fourteen. <clears throat> <laughs> That would be, well, I mean, that would get the lard, so. <laughs> Goodbye, Scotty. <laughs> uh, man, no, I don't know. There's not, like, anything, like, so awful out there that, yeah, that, like, is still existing that I would say, like, oh, yeah, we need to get rid of that. Like, get it off the railroad, maybe, like, the SW 1500s. I didn't want them anymore, but that's, uh, that's uh, I don't know. Uh, any any other things other than the six fourteen that we should kill? Uh, uh, any of the CNO Kanawas because they're expendable because there's like twelve of them left. <laughs> Doesn't mean we should, but but you could and nobody would know. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez. Well, with that, uh, any last questions in chat here? Uh, if anyone's got anything else, you know, uh, th that's going to be it for the stream here. So if you got a last question, last minute, say what you got. Let's see. Oh, I had one that I kind of wanted answered, uh, but it was submitted earlier. Sure. Yeah, no, what, whatever you got. Uh, how did each of the individual locomotives arrive at the museum? Uh, 20 and 346 <laughs> came on the same truck um, or in the same convoy. Uh, there's pictures of 2318 and 346 all on the same, like backs of the same like trailers at the museum somewhere. I'd have to ask Matt Isaacs probably for him. Um, and then 491 came later um, in 1985, also on the back of a Rio Grande Motorways truck. That's fun. But on the back of a Rio Grande Motorways truck that was clearly not designed for its weight. Like they just slapped it on a truck and called it a day. Like not no like just an eighteen wheeler, no extra axles, no extra nothing, no stinger off the back, just K thirty seven on a truck that looked like it was gonna break in half. <laughs> so, um, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> oh, and it was Ekipus. The BBJ finally made it on camera. It did. I've had it on my desk waiting for the moment. Yeah, it's not a BBC. It's a BBJ. Anyway. Oh, bro. <laughs> Single tier. Uh, Captain Viridian, totally not ripping off the other question. If you could bring a singular scrapped locomotive concept engine back to life, what would it be? Uh, Uinta articulated, hands down. Yes. Uh, for everyone else, if I didn't get to your questions, I mean, we only got through approximately uh, a third of the questions asked on the post. I've bolded the ones that I answered. And I'll reply back to those saying, hey, it was answered in this stream. Uh, and then the rest of them we'll be getting to next month. So anyway. <laughs> no, yes, I hope I don't see you my K-37 in your dreams. Terribly sorry for the psychological warfare. Well, thank you, friend. I appreciate you. you uh, you've, you've made it worth my while at the very least. So anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. We will catch you all next time. <laughs>